five years ago, the existence of dungeons was confirmed. They appeared simultaneously in different parts of the earth, and with them a huge number of monsters. Later this event was called a general panic. Five years later, on the island of Hokkaido in Sapporo, there is the largest Chikaho dungeon, right outside the gates of Odori Park. Here the hero passes by one of the soldiers. He immediately looks around. His friend asks him about the fact that it seems to him that he crashed into someone. The hero is Karaboshi Haruki. He is 27 years old. He is an aspiring adventurer. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that there are always a lot of people in Chikaho, but in his opinion there are even more of them. He is upset that he has not found anything again. His pouch is empty. It just so happens that Karaboshi Haruki is not popular. During that mess, the Japanese government awarded the distinguished the title of adventurer. The work of an adventurer is very dangerous. They have to go down into the dungeons and fight monsters. Karaboshi Haruki goes to the car and thinks that he needs to work harder. He looks at the phone and thinks that there are people who are helped by such adventures to get a job. He could be the mascot of the company. Then he hears people cheerfully greeting Tatsuna, whose blog they are reading. Karaboshi Haruki looks at his phone and thinks in frustration that he also runs his blog. But no one reads it. Karaboshi Haruki gets into the car and decides to go home. He drives through the neighborhood and thinks that this area has been destroyed. But it was recently restored. Karaboshi Haruki opens the garage door, thinking about how tired he is. And then he notices a passage to the dungeon in his garage. Karaboshi Haruki shouts in shock that there is a pit there. And then he realizes that this is the entrance to the dungeon. He doesn't understand why and how it happened. Then Karaboshi Haruki screams about what happened to his snowplow. It was worth 300,000 yen. He's been saving up for it for so long. But more importantly, how will he survive the winter without her? He has to dig snow with his hands. Then Karaboshi Haruki notices a sign on the floor. He picks it up, and then the sign lights up with a bright light. And immediately the sign dissolves inside Haruka's Karaboshi. He is shocked that the tablet has entered his body. He thinks that he has a foreign object inside him. And then a console appears in the air in front of him. And then he looks at the panel in front of him, where his name, age and gender are written. He has three skill points. He is shocked to think that he sees his own profile. The military arrive at the house of Karaboshi Haruka. They get out of the car and wonder if a call has come from this house. Yes, it was in this garage that the entrance to the dungeon appeared. Someone from the military asks about where the owner of the house is. Here they are approached by Karaboshi Haruki, who says hello to them. The military does not seem to see him and says that they hope they are not too late. They say they can ring the bell. Karaboshi Haruki, realizing that he is not heard, coughs and says that he is here. Here Karaboshi Haruki appears in front of the military, who in shock shout about where he came from. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that yes, he is always overlooked. He thought that becoming an adventurer would make him more visible. He remembers how the girls, standing next to him, are discussing where Karaboshi Haruki has gone and who he is. He's never been seen in class. The teacher calls Karaboshi Haruki and asks if he is here when he is standing next to him. The soldier apologizes to Karaboshi Haruka and asks to show him the documents. He gives them away and says here. He needs to get out of this awkward situation somehow. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that one day there will come a time when he will no longer be an empty place. The military asks Karaboshi Haruka if he went down into the dungeon. Karaboshi Haruki answers no. The military says it's good. He will be able to enter there safely when they set up the barricades. Karaboshi Haruki sees the barricades set up and tells the military that they have already coped so quickly. They say it's their job. Then someone from the military asks Karaboshi Haruka if he didn't lose anything in the dungeon. He replies that he lost a snowplow there. The military says they are sorry for such a loss. Later, the military leaves, saying that they think it's time for them. Karaboshi Haruki thanks the military for their help. One of them asks him about going for a run. He replies that it is. The military asks Karaboshi Haruki to be careful. He says that the barricades are set up for caution, which never hurts. Karaboshi Haruki thanks the military, saying thank you very much. The military leave, and Karaboshi Haruki looks after the departing cars. Karaboshi Haruki gathers his equipment and says it's time for him. He goes towards adventures, passing through barricades and descending into dungeons. Here Karaboshi Haruki calls the console. He studies her and says that everything is as he thought. This console only works in the dungeon. Magical artifacts. They can be found in treasure chests or after defeating monsters. Artifacts have different effects that increase human abilities. Karaboshi Haruki sits down on the steps and thinks that maybe there is some kind of guide. Here he presses the button for beginners. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that if H is a beginner, then or C is the best. 
Probably it is possible to develop artifacts or skills with the help of skill points. Karaboshi Haruki looks at the skill table with interest. Just like in games, Karaboshi Haruki looks at the stealth skill. Karaboshi Haruki shouts in shock that it can't be. Shouldn't this skill be pumped into him to the maximum? Karaboshi Haruki is thinking about what special skills are. It's not like it's a hobby or some kind of reward. He looks at the decoding of the skill that after defeating monsters they get more points. Then Karaboshi Haruki starts pressing buttons on the console. After he shouts damn, he put everything into this game. Karaboshi Haruki shouts in frustration that he should have thought better. He could have pumped something else. Karaboshi Haruki ruefully thinks that he hopes that it is possible to redistribute points somehow. He gets up on the step saying that well, let's go. Karaboshi Haruki descends deep into the dungeon and, looking around in fascination, enthusiastically shouts wow. Karaboshi Haruki touches the walls and thinks about how bright it is around. The walls seem to be studying the light. He thinks that the wall feels like clay, but it's so hard. He hopes the wall won't collapse. Here Karaboshi Haruki turns his head and notices a huge beetle next to him. Karaboshi Haruki screams in horror that it is a huge Scolopendra. As it is said about her in the wiki, the Scolopendra is a monster of the lowest level. She is moving slowly. Her weaknesses are the antennae and the head. Karaboshi Haruki puts a dagger in front of him, thinking that the Scolopendra is guided by antennas. She won't be able to attack if he cuts them off, and then he will finish her off with a blow to the head. A huge Scolopendra walks around Haruki's Karaboshi in a circle, and immediately Haruki attacks Karaboshi who barely manages to dodge, but the attack still gets her. Karaboshi Haruki says that in the wiki it was said that the Scolopendra is slow, but in real life it is very fast. Karaboshi Haruki says with a smile that everything will be fine, he can handle it, and then he throws himself into an attack on the insect. Karaboshi Haruki jumps with a knife on the beetle, but the knife does not pierce the scales. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that the insect's armor is very strong. Karaboshi Haruki jumps up and thinks that the Scolopendra is faster than he thought. But despite all this, he is still stronger than her. Karaboshi Haruki shouts that he is ready. It will hit the same point. Karaboshi Haruki forcefully plunges a dagger into the head of a Scolopendra. He punches the insect's head with his blow. Karaboshi Haruki exhales happily. The monster is defeated, and Karaboshi Haruki falls wearily to the ground. He says that this is his first experience. Karaboshi Haruki gets up, dusts off his knees and says it's okay. He needs to cut up a huge Scolopendra before other monsters come running. Then something strange starts happening to Karaboshi Haruki. He starts shaking. It becomes difficult for him to breathe. Sweat starts dripping from Karaboshi Haruka's face. He understands that this is a high-level ailment. Karaboshi Haruki wipes his mouth and sweating thinks about what is strange. This has never happened in Chikaho. Is it really all because of the acceleration of growth? Karaboshi Haruki wonders that maybe it's all because of the Scolopendra. Starts butchering the monster. He thinks that he has gained so much experience for such a weak monster. In any case, these parts of the monster can be used as armor. Karaboshi Haruki wonders what is interesting is generally normal for the first experience. Karaboshi Haruki wipes his forehead which is dripping with sweat. After Karaboshi Haruki butchered a huge Scolopendra, he says that it's like this. He took off the monster's armor. Karaboshi Haruki says that an insect shell and its other parts can make a whole set of armor, and all this can be sold at a good price, although it will be difficult for him to endure all this. Karaboshi Haruki looks at the parts of the monster and realizes that his bag will not fit so much. And the rest, Karaboshi Haruki takes a piece of Scolopendra meat and thinks about whether it is possible to eat it. He remembers that the ancestors divided monsters into two types. They divided the monsters into edible and inedible. Karaboshi Haruki cuts off a piece of meat and puts a slimy piece in his mouth. Karaboshi Haruki starts chewing meat. The meat of the Scolopendra is tasteless and odorless. He chews the meat and then washes it down with water. He thinks that the meat of the Scolopendra can certainly be eaten. But what's the point if the meat has no taste? With the advent of dungeons, land prices soared and there was a shortage of food. Even vegetables have now become privileges for the rich. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that a huge Scolopendra can be left for a rainy day. Later, Karaboshi Haruki returns home. He takes a shower and sits down at the computer. When Karaboshi Haruki wipes his hair with a towel, something catches his attention. He notices the updates. Becoming an Adventurer is a website where adventurers share their experiences with each other. This is especially useful for beginners like him. It says here that the level of survivability increases after the first visit to the site. There is a wiki section that describes all the monsters and ways to deal with them. Karaboshi Haruki notices a bulletin board for exchanging various information. 
and blogs that are updated every day. Kariboshi Haruki clicks on the computer mouse. It says that the update is completed. It's not every day someone finds a dungeon at home. He is sure that all people will be interested in it. He published an article there about his first experience in the dungeon. He presents comments about how cool it is and how envious he is. He shouts internet, glory, and here he is. But an hour later he has only three views. Kariboshi Haruki ruefully thinks about why. Kariboshi Haruki lowers his head in frustration and thinks about where his millions of views are. Everything is so bad for him. Maybe his viewing counter is broken. Let someone tell him that the meter is broken. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the computer screen with tears in his eyes and talks about why no one reads him. His blogs are no worse than the blogs of top guys. And then he sees that Bakansen has an update. Rankers are the people with the highest ranks in different categories of blogs on Become an Adventurer. The rankers will usually sign contracts with different companies. They get free weapons, as well as good money. One such ranger is back in Sam. He's a pumped up old man who doesn't wear clothes. He prefers to go to the dungeons alone and tells everyone that he does it for fun. But his strength is impressive. Masatsugu Sam. That ranger, on the contrary, is determined to win. He actively storms the dungeons and explores them. He is a great strategist and an unshakable ranger. He holds the record for the longest outing in the most difficult dungeon in Japan, Shinjuku Station. Kariboshi Haruki is upset saying that Masatsugu has no new updates. Maybe he's on a sortie. Kariboshi Haruki talks about how cool it is. He would also like to become Bakansan's disciple. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the monitor screen with tears in his eyes. He opens Shigurasan's page. She is the only girl with a top rank. She has been training in the dojo since childhood and has not lost a single battle. Kariboshi Haruki sees that she has no updates and thinks that Shigurasan is also on a sortie. He thinks that all these rankers are so cool. And he's kind of not. He sees that he still has three views and zero comments. He mentally screams and thinks why, and begins to cry from sadness. Here he taps his hand loudly on the table. He thinks that he doesn't have time to cry, and he has an incomprehensible magical thing that needs to be studied. After all, a dungeon appeared in his garage. Kariboshi Haruki opens the window and thinks that this way he will definitely become stronger, and he will finally be noticed. He decides to go to the dungeon again. Kariboshi Haruki forcefully plunges a dagger into the body of a huge scolopendra. He pulls out a knife, and the insect's body falls lifeless in front of him. Kariboshi Haruki exhales. He looks at the body of the monster at his feet and the body of another monster, which lies slightly to the side. Kariboshi Haruki says that he has already killed more than a hundred huge scolopendras. He looks at the insect bodies scattered on the floor of the dungeon. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that he is a little ashamed of something. He feels like he's hitting little kids. Kariboshi Haruki looks at his hands and says that it looks like he has improved resistance to ailments. Kariboshi Haruki walks and holds a map in his hands. He draws it, having made the next way. Kariboshi Haruki goes to a new place and thinks that, apparently, this is the end of the first floor. Here a pebble crunches under the foot of Kariboshi Haruka, and then there is a strange sound. Kariboshi Haruki raises his head and sees huge hordes of monsters on the ceiling. He is in shock and in horror, screaming seriously. Immediately, insects descend from the ceiling and prepare to attack Haruki's Kariboshi. The same one is ready to fight. He draws his dagger and enters the fight. And then a monster sneaks up on him from behind, and Kariboshi Haruki kills him with one swing of his dagger. He happily shouts while, he coped with the monster with one blow. But yesterday he killed only one monster, and he hasn't come to the surface for a long time. He loses a little sense of reality. Kariboshi Haruki stands in the middle of the bodies of dead scolopendras and looks at the dagger in his hands. He says that maybe it's all because of accelerated growth. Kariboshi Haruki sits down in front of the insect's body and says 200. In Chikaho, you would have to compete with other adventurers. And here he killed more than 200 in just a couple of days. Kariboshi Haruki looks at his hands and thinks that even if his strength is growing very fast, he does not notice it. And more, even if he gets better physically, his strength will already be at its maximum. He won't have to do any more beginner stuff. He sees that the blade of his dagger has completely fallen into disrepair. Kariboshi Haruki says it's also time for him to change weapons. Kariboshi Haruki stands in front of the steps leading down and opens the console. Kariboshi Haruki studies her and says that it looks like there wasn't even a boss on this floor, and he didn't get any skill points. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the ladder and says that sooner or later his level will rise. Kariboshi Haruki says with a smile that he is already going to the second floor. Kariboshi Haruki goes and looks around, thinking that everything looks exactly the same. He had heard that the terrain would not change until the 10th floor. 
The deeper the dungeon, the more difficult it becomes. Only about 10% of adventurers reach the 10th floor, the so-called middle level. Upper levels are levels up to 10. Middle levels are levels up to 20, lower levels are levels up to 50. Since all adventurers work only for themselves, there is not much information about the lower levels. And they also say that the size of the dungeon floors increases as you progress through the levels. Karaboshi Haruki happily shouts that he can't wait. He wonders what kind of monsters will be there. Then Karaboshi Haruki notices something. He sees growing plants and wonders what it is. Here these plants come out of the ground, and they immediately rush to Haruki's Karaboshi. He screams in horror. They turn out to be little monsters. Kariboshi Haruki opens his eyes in shock. And then, after a short time, Kariboshi Haruki stands in the middle of lifeless bows, clutching one of the sprouts in his hands. He is in shock and does not understand how it happened. He looks at the chopped and lifeless onion. Kariboshi Haruki opens his mouth and shouts that he can no longer. There are tears in his eyes. He shouts that the onion is too vigorous. He urgently needs to go home. Later, Kariboshi Haruki hangs a bow in the yard of his house on a special rack. Kariboshi Haruki looks at his work and says that he needs to become a monopolist selling vegetable monsters, at least to take such a title in autumn. Kariboshi Haruki holds his dagger in his hands, whose blade has broken apart. Kariboshi Haruki says that vegetable monsters are often hunted, and at the same time his blade broke. Kariboshi Haruki decides to go to the gun shop the next day. The girl sits and sighs heavily, talking about how bored she is. She wonders if he will fulfill the norm today. And she sighs heavily again, standing behind the counter of a gun store. Kariboshi Haruki is eating at this time, and he clearly likes the food. He thinks with a smile that she has divine taste. He happily thinks that, as he expected, Katori-san cooks the best eggs. They are much tastier than Scalopendra. Katori-san, seeing such a customer's love, laughs and says that he is glad. Later, Katori-san sits with Kariboshi Haruki on the window and asks him that it's really not a burden to him. He says that Kariboshi Haruki brought him so many fresh onions. He tells Katori-san with a smile that he can consider it a thank you for his constant help. Besides, they are neighbors and should help each other. They live 10 minutes away from each other. Katori-san leans over to the boxes of onions that Kariboshi Haruki brought and looks at the vegetables. He closes his eyes sadly and says that once upon a time he and his wife collected onions together. That was before his wife was killed by a monster. And the bow awakens Katori's memories of his late wife. The man says God, why did Orna die before him? He misses her so much. Kariboshi Haruki has tired sad eyes and doesn't know what to say to a man. Later, he goes to the car and apologizes to Katori for having to feed him. He replies to Kariboshi Haruki that it's okay and thanks the latter. He asks Kariboshi Haruki that he will go to the dungeon again. Kariboshi Haruki replies aha with a smile. But first he has something else to do. Kariboshi Haruki brings Scalopendra shells to the store, which is very shocking to the girl who is there. She doesn't understand what it is in front of her. And again, like everyone else, she doesn't notice Haruka's Kariboshi. He is desperately trying to attract the attention of the saleswoman. And when he shouts loudly I'm here, the girl screams in horror. Kariboshi Haruki points to a pile of Scalopendra shells in front of him and asks the seller to evaluate what he brought. The girl looks around the shells and asks that she needs to evaluate all this. She thinks to herself about where the hell Haruki Kariboshi came from. The same one answers the seller with a smile that he brought about 200 pieces of Scalopendra shells. The girl asks Kariboshi Haruka about whether all the shells belong to him. He replies that yes, that's right. Internally, Kariboshi Haruki is proud. The girl speaks well and immediately asks Kariboshi Haruki to wait a minute. She later tells Kariboshi Haruki that the assessment is complete. She counted only 216 shells. The ones without damage are priced at 1,000 yen apiece, and the scratched ones at 100 yen apiece. The girl points her finger at the documents. The result was 153 800 yen. The girl asks Kariboshi Haruka that if he is satisfied with such an amount, the money will be transferred to his card. He is shocked by this arrangement of things. Later, Kariboshi Haruki looks at the documents with a smile and thinks that the glasses from the site added another 5%. So the total amount came out to 161,460 yen. He mentally thanks Scalopender. He thanks the seller and thinks that now he will have something to buy gasoline with. Kariboshi Haruki is thinking where he should go next. And later he comes to the store with a gun. He looks at the armor and says that he is so happy. Here Kariboshi Haruki looks at the sword standing behind the glass. He smiles and thinks that this two-handed sword is so cool, many adventurers use the same. 
could go to the dungeon with such weapons, this is the spirit of adventure. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that a dagger would be more suitable for his image, so he will stand out from the rest. He imagines how he fights, and the people watching cheerfully shout that Karaboshi Haruki is fighting such a monster alone. It attracts attention that he fights with one dagger. Here Kuroboshi Haruki draws attention to the rack with daggers. He sees a werewolf dagger worth 1 million yen. He is shocked to think that this weapon is worth a million yen. Kuroboshi Haruki thinks that the price is as expected from a middle-class weapon. Then a girl comes up to him and says welcome. She asks Kuroboshi Haruka if he liked the dagger. Kuroboshi Haruki doesn't know what to answer, and the girl says that if so, now she will open a showcase for him. Kariboshi Haruki is shocked to think that this girl has noticed his presence. Kariboshi Haruki turns away from the girl who is already opening the window. He thinks about how nervous he is. Even more than then with the Scalopendras, Kariboshi Haruki thinks that he is so happy. Then the girl calls him. She opened the window and asks Kariboshi Haruki if he would like to hold or try out the dagger. Kariboshi Haruki takes the werewolf dagger with his hand. And then his eyes open in shock. He sweats all over and gets angry, shouting that he can't pick up a weapon. The girl with a smile tells Kariboshi Haruki that the weapon made from the materials of the dungeon itself chooses the owner. The same one, hearing her words, thinks that this is what it is, and imagines that a mid-level adventurer can use a weapon against a mid-level monster and cannot use it against a high-level monster. The girl with a smile tells Kariboshi Haruki that since this weapon does not suit him, then maybe he will try other models. They are a little more expensive, but they are simply excellent in battle. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the newly introduced weapon in shock. Kariboshi Haruki picks up the dagger and thinks that the weapon is a little heavy, but quite comfortable. The sales girl tells Kariboshi Haruki that he has a silver wolf dagger in his hands. Kariboshi Haruki twists the dagger and tries it in his hands. The girl, looking at his manipulations, says that it seems this weapon suits him. Kariboshi Haruki tells her exactly with a smile. He asks her why she sells equipment that doesn't suit customers at all. The girl answers him that there are people who buy equipment based on its appearance and cost, and then, she remembers a man shouting at her about why the sword is so bad. He demands to return the money to him, but get moving. Kariboshi Haruki tells the girl that she is having a hard time. She replies with a smile that she does not allow such types to get away with it. She imagines hitting the guy who scolded her in her weapon. With a smile, she tells Kariboshi Haruki not to worry, she can definitely tell by his face. Kariboshi Haruki screams that he is absolutely not going to return the dagger and the girl cannot worry. The girl apologizes to Kariboshi Haruka for her question, but she asks him if he is an adventurer of the average level. Kariboshi Haruki replies that no, he is still a beginner. The girl in shock says that it's true, but his leather armor is completely worn out. Kariboshi Haruki scratches the back of his head with a smile, saying that he is not at all. He's just not very experienced yet. The girl touches his armor and says that there are so many scratches on it. Immediately, the girl jumps over the table and sits on it. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about how deftly the girl does. She also tells him that what he is doing is reckless. The girl leans towards Kariboshi Haruki and says she doesn't want him to die. She asks Kariboshi Haruka that isn't she right. He shouts back at her that no, she's right. The girl asks Kariboshi Haruki that he could not then put on better armor. Or he can. But Haruki Kariboshi does not let her finish, shouting that he will buy this armor for the sake of the girl. And then she sells him a strange mask worth 500 yen, a centipede armor worth 50,000 yen, a silver wolf dagger worth 98,000 yen. Kariboshi Haruki leave the store, leaving 148 500 yen in it. The girl shouts after him, thank you very much. The sales girl is Yujuki Akane. She is 27 years old. She's a salesman at the Ikabishi gun store. She shouts with a smile that this is a full class. She can't believe she just met the norm. Yujuki Akane says that God, how difficult it was for her to develop skills to such a level. A damn mask with this terrible smell that no one wanted to buy. And she sold it, despite the fact that the mask is not even magical. This guy was so easy to get divorced for shopping. Yujuki Akane walks around the store with a smile and says that he will have to go to the next one to show off. And then she pays attention to something. She remembers how Kariboshi Haruki took the dagger. The silver wolf dagger cannot be used without reaching at least an average level. The silver wolf is a monster that appears on the 6th, 8th floors of the Chikaho dungeon. His fangs are used to make high-quality weapons, ideal for medium levels. So they write on the wiki become an adventurer. Yujuki Akane wonders about that guy, why he told her he was a beginner. 
Here she still thinks and says that although she doesn't really care. And Kariboshi Haruki stands with his purchases and shouts in shock about why he only bought so much. Later, a lot of people gather on the first floor of the Chikaho dungeon. Kariboshi Haruki walks in the crowd and looking around at the people around him thinks that after what happened in the dungeon in the garage, he can't understand why Chikaho attracts so many people. But people there are attracted by a large number of monsters. Kariboshi Haruki thinks with a smile that before that he had always fought monsters only on the first and second floors. But today everything will be different. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that one day he will go to the lowest level of the dungeon. Kariboshi Haruki goes down, and later, sitting and studying his console, says that his level has risen. Kariboshi Haruki, studying the console, thinks that as he knew, the level increases when descending to the lower floors of the dungeons, and also added skill points. It looks like he can't get skills outside of dungeons if the monsters are too weak. Here Kariboshi Haruki abruptly kills a huge beetle with one blow. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the insect's corpse and says that it is so weak. It looks like the Scalopendras won't give him any more problems. Kariboshi Haruki looks at his weapon and thinks that his speed and strength are caused by the blade. That scared saleswoman said that the blade was very good in battle. Kariboshi Haruki blushes, remembering the girl saleswoman. He shouts loudly that okay, it's time for him to do it. Kariboshi Haruki goes downstairs, thinking that there should be fewer people there now. But this means that there will be more monsters. Then Kariboshi Haruki hears someone screaming. Then a rabbit crashes into Haruki's Kariboshi, and immediately a man runs to him, into which the rabbit flies back. This is not just a rabbit, but a killer rabbit. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about what a powerful attack it was. If it wasn't for his new armor, he would have been finished by now. The killer rabbit is a deadly rabbit that quickly attacks its victims with powerful paws. The meat and horns of male rabbits can be sold dearly. Kariboshi Haruki shouts that the rabbit is much stronger than the Scalopendra, and he feels that that rabbit wants to kill him. Kariboshi Haruki laughs, and immediately the killer rabbit jumps on him again. Kariboshi Haruki covers himself with his hands, defending himself from the attack. He throws the rabbit back. The monster lands on the ground, immediately pushes off from it with its paws and rushes to attack again. And when the rabbit attacks Haruki's Kariboshi, he knocks the rabbit to the ground with a dagger and the animal falls down without strength. Kariboshi Haruki panting in shock says that he killed the monster. Then three other adventurers run up to him, who ask about what happened. They just caught up with this rabbit, and the monster is already dead. Kariboshi Haruki apologizes to them with a smile, saying that he has already finished the rabbit. But people don't seem to notice him and say that something killed the rabbit before them. Here Kariboshi Haruki looks wide-eyed at his hand, and thinks about what is happening to him, why he is shaking. Is it really all because of the monster? One of the adventurers says it's fine, but he hopes they've bought time. They start discussing something. And when they shout that the monster parade is coming, then Kariboshi Haruki, eyes wide open, thinks about what the guys in front of him are talking about. The guys shout that they hope that their bait will delay them. And immediately three of the adventurers run past Kariboshi Haruka sitting on the ground. And he gets up and runs in the opposite direction from them. Someone is walking in a crowd of people. This is a girl who walks through the crowd. Then someone asks her that she's not Karen Chan by any chance. She confusedly says that yes, she is Karen. Immediately, three guys start discussing her answer, saying that so it's true. It was one of them who wrote on the recruit search form. They thought it was trolling or some kind of gay. Karen bows her head in front of the guys and says that she is counting on them today. They answer that they also count on her. They are pleased to meet her. The guys introduce themselves. Their names are Lars, Kashima and Haria. Kashima leans over to Karen and says that he knows that they just met, but he is interested in how old Karen is. She replies that she is 18 years old. Haria asks Karen if this is true. She barely came of age. Lars, hearing this, asks the others if they can rely on Karen. She shudders after such a question. And then Lars says that it's better than being alone with a newcomer Shikama. Haria supports him, saying that it's really better than staying with naked Shikama and his sword. Karen looks down sadly and thinks that she should check the equipment. Kashima coughs and tells Karen that okay, it's time for them to go. She's new here, so she needs to not overdo it. And the main thing she should do is stay close to them. Karen readily shouts well. Kashima tells her that it won't be difficult. They usually go down below the ninth floor. Karen says great, then they should hurry up. Later, as they descend, Karen bends over and breathes heavily. Then someone touches her with his hand and asks if everything is okay with her. This is Kashima, standing next to Karen. Haria turns to them and says that Karen looks tired. And Lars says, seeing her condition, that she's still a beginner, it's not surprising. 
Karen thinks that she feels bad about killing high-level monsters like that. She doesn't know if she can get up. Then Kashima shouts to the others that they need a break. Karen immediately shouts that there is no need to rest, she is fine. Kashima answers her well and immediately adds that for an ordinary girl, Karen is very brave. She looks at him in shock, and Kashima immediately continues, saying that usually adventurers do not go down below the first two floors. Lars supports him, saying that because below is quite dangerous. There is a sound and Karen opens her eyes in shock. Haria stands in front of them, preparing for battle. Lars sneaks up to him and asks about the fact that their opponents are already here. Haria answers him that not yet, but they will arrive soon. Karen says it's bad and asks what they will do. Haria shouts back that isn't it obvious. Lars takes his weapon and runs after Haria, shouting that they are getting out of here. Karen and Kashima turn around in surprise after them. Karen screams about why they're running away. Kashima also runs away after his comrades and shouts that the parade is approaching. Karen asks in shock about the parade. Kashima shouts to her that the monster parade is coming. Karen opens her eyes in shock. A monster parade is a massive movement of monsters into a dungeon. The reasons may be different, but at this time it is better for adventurers to stay away from him. Karen begins to tremble all over and looks deep into the cave. She hears the footsteps of many monsters. She understands that she needs to run. Then she notices that Kashima, Lars and Haria have already run far away. She is shocked to think that they are running away without her. She shouts at them to wait for her. She runs towards them, and the guys stop. Kashima shouts to her that she is digging him, and Lars screams at her that she's a stupid girl. Kashima rushes to her aid, but Lars holds him back, shouting to him what he is doing. He replies that he cannot be called a man unless he helps Karen. Haria shouts to them that someone is fighting ahead, judging by the sounds. Haria and Lars immediately begin to reproach Kashim that he apparently wants to fall into a trap. They cannot wait, and thereby take risks. It's settled. Karen runs towards them, not understanding what they are arguing about. Here Kashima, Lars and Haria stop and immediately get into fighting positions. Karen looks at them in shock, not understanding their behavior. She wonders about what they are going to fight. She can't believe it. She is glad to have such strong people around her. Karen almost reaches Kashima, thinking that she needs to get behind them so as not to get hit. And then Kashima forcefully hits her with a shield. Karen flies away and falls to the ground, leaving behind a layer of dust. She looks in shock in front of her, thinking about what happened. Kashima looks at her mockingly and mockingly asking for forgiveness, says that someone should become a bait. They leave Karen lying on the ground while they shout that it's time for them to get out of here. Kashima, Lars and Haria run away, leaving Karen lying on the ground. She stretches out her arms in their direction, unable to even utter weight. She remains powerless to lie on the ground. Then she hears a sound and turns around in horror. A huge flock of killer rabbits is approaching her. They sniff, surrounding her from all sides. Karen looks at them and bursts into tears. She thinks that she doesn't want to die. She asks someone to save her. Then Karaboshi Haruki approaches her, running as fast as he can. He thinks that the noise is getting louder and louder. He looks around the corner and sees a huge flock of killer rabbits. And just like that, Karaboshi Haruki notices Karen surrounded by a huge pack of monsters from all sides. She is trembling all over, tears are streaming down her cheeks. Karaboshi Haruki opens his skill panel and begins to study his characteristics. He thinks that okay, even though it's not enough, but he has to try. Karaboshi Haruki puts on a mask, thinking that every point of strength will be useful to him. The rabbits rush at Karen, and she screams in horror. Karen closes her eyes, preparing to face death. But then she is saved by Karaboshi Haruki, cutting his way through a crowd of rabbits. Karen looks at him in shock, and immediately the rest of the killer rabbits jump past her and rush at Haruki Karaboshi, who meets them with his dagger in his hands. Rabbits jump into the air and attack Karaboshi Haruki. He cuts them with one blow. He thinks to himself that it's just one skill point each. Karaboshi Haruki rushes into battle, and thinks that he feels completely different, even though they have improved by only one. His whole body is on fire, he's terribly sick, and his head is splitting. Karaboshi Haruki thinks with a smile that he is starting to like it all. Karaboshi Haruki fights with rabbits and thinks that here he is the real spirit of adventure. Karaboshi Haruki is breathing heavily, and then he looks at the ceiling in surprise. Karaboshi Haruki sighs heavily, and the bodies of dead killer rabbits are lying around him everywhere. He says out loud that he is glad that he survived in the end. And then he notices Karen, who is already on her feet. She looks at Haruki's Karaboshi in shock and is afraid of something. He thinks that Karen was probably scared by his mask. Karen apologizes to Karaboshi Haruka for this strange sound. Karaboshi Haruki replies to her that everything is fine. 
he thinks to himself that he can still take off his mask. Karen touches Karaboshi Haruka's hand. He looks at her in shock. Karen, bursting into tears, says to Karaboshi Haruki, thank you so much for saving her. Karaboshi Haruki doesn't immediately know what to answer, and the only thing he says is that no problem. Karen cries and says that she really thought that she was finished. Her tears are dripping onto Karaboshi Haruka's hands. He looks at her in shock, and then Karen has a real tantrum. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that this girl survived thanks to him. He is glad that he managed to save her. Later, Kuroboshi Haruki stuffs bags with the bodies of killer rabbits. He thanks Karen for helping him collect all these materials. He doesn't know how to address her, since she didn't give her name. Karen immediately realizes her mistake and introduces herself. Kuroboshi Haruki answers her by telling her his name. Karen looks at him and thinks that he is not going to take off his mask. Kuroboshi Haruki takes his bag and says it's time to go back. Karen asks his permission to carry one of the bags. Karaboshi Haruki asks her if she is sure of such a decision. Karen takes the bag and asks Karaboshi Haruki if he is a ranger. He replies that he does not. He's just a beginner. Karen shouts in shock that how can he be a beginner? He climbed to fight the monster crowd, despite the fact that he is a beginner. Karaboshi Haruki says aha, something pushed him to this. Karen asks him if his words are true. He thinks to himself that he is in shock from his act. Kariboshi Haruki thinks it's all thanks to the skill panel, but even if he tells Karen about it, out loud, Kariboshi Haruki says that he came across a party of three adventurers while walking towards monsters. He asks Karen if she knows them. She lowers her eyes, saying well, she's thinking about something. She replies to Kariboshi Haruki that these guys took her to their party. She met them on the forum. She thought they would help her to level up, but Karen clutches her weapon with force. Kariboshi Haruki looks at her, understanding everything. He thinks that the task of adventurers is to protect people. He cannot forgive those who are reckless about their work or abandon the weak. Of course, there are times when it's better to abandon your comrades. But these guys, he remembers the screams of Lars, Haria and Kashim. Let's run away from here. We should have left earlier. Karen was just a bait. Kariboshi Haruki concludes that such people cannot be forgiven. Yuyujuki Akane tells the girl to look. She shows a statement telling the girl with glasses that compared to last year, the income of her store has increased by 200%. It has increased by as much as 200%. The girl shouts at Yuyujuki Akane to shut up. He's pissing her off already. The same one asks the girl about how her store is doing, whether everything is fine with it. The girl with angrily clenching her teeth answers her that despite the fact that they are both managers, she's the boss of Yuyujuki Akane, and has she really forgotten that? Her attitude. Yuyujuki Akane replies to the girl that she is her boss only because she works longer. Yuyujuki Akane jumps on the table and says that in their time everyone is only interested in the results. She asks about what and which of them has the obvious superiority. She has a beautiful young girl with a decent result. Or she has an average, looking old lady. The girl in anger shouts to her about who she called an old lady. Here someone interrupts the dialogue of the girls, saying, I'm sorry. Immediately, Yuyujuki Akane and the girl, who are looking at each other with anger, turn to the newcomer. They have business-like smiles on their faces. They synchronously say welcome. This is Kariboshi Haruki, who still hasn't taken off his mask, and says it's him. In his hands he has a bag full of dead rabbits. Karen is standing behind him. The girls look at them in complete shock. Kariboshi Haruki tells the girls that he would like to sell it all. And he also asks to check these materials on. The girl with glasses looks at Yuyujuki Akane who immediately hid behind the counter, shock is red in her eyes. When she sees his mask, she thinks that it seems that this is exactly the same client who was with her recently. The girl with glasses looks at the product offered by Kariboshi Haruki and asks him that these are the horns of the killer rabbits, is it true? Her words interest Yujuki Akane. Karen says she thinks he has about 100 pieces of these horns. The girl in shock screams A after her words. Yuyujuki Akane thinks that killer rabbits are not monsters that a beginner can handle. And he laid a hundred in one evening. She is very surprised by this. Although not, females have no horns, so there could have been more killer rabbits in the fight with Kariboshi Haruki. If he coped with them, then he is clearly not a beginner. The girl with glasses thanks Kariboshi Haruki and Karen for waiting. She says that here is his reward for 101 killer rabbit horns he gets 202,000 yen. She asks Kariboshi Haruka if everything suits him. He replies that yes, of course. The girl asks Kariboshi Haruki if he wants to use the command function. Kariboshi Haruki in response asks her what it is. The girl answers him that this is a function in which the amount of remuneration is divided and paid to each party participant. 
Service points are awarded for this, so the offer is very worthwhile. Karen listens to the girl with interest, and Karaboshi Haruki, too, after listening to her, says that he understood everything, so they will do it. Karen opens her eyes in shock. She immediately shouts to Karaboshi Haruki that it's not necessary, she didn't do anything. Karaboshi Haruki laughs and asks Karen if she helped him carry all these horns. Karen replies that that's all she did. She didn't help Karaboshi Haruki fight killer rabbits. Karaboshi Haruki tells Karen that since she demands it, then since Karen carried 48 horns, she will receive half the amount for them. That's what Karen deserved for her help. Yuyujuki Akane opens his eyes in shock after his words, thinking that this girl only carried horns. Then all these monsters were killed by this guy. The girl with glasses tells Karaboshi Haruki that she asks her to forgive, but half of the amount for 48 horns cannot be paid. Here Yuyujuki Akane jumps out of his hiding place and grabs the girl by the shoulder, shouting to her to come here. Karaboshi Haruki looks at them in shock, and then the girls disappear behind the counter. Karaboshi Haruki realizes that Yuyujuki Akane seems familiar to him. Yuyujuki Akane asks the girl why she doesn't want to read them the amount of the reward. She asks her question in a whisper. The girl also answers her because, if she recalculates it, then she will have to work once again. The girl continues, saying that she is very sensitive about recycling, and she also does not want the boss to yell at her. Yuyujuki Akane listening to her says that for. She asks the girl that she is completely stupid or something. That would explain, in principle, why it works so slowly. The girl in response in anger shouts to Yuyujuki Akane that she wants to say in her own words. Yuyujuki Akane gets out from behind the counter and asks Karaboshi Haruki for forgiveness, asking him to wait a minute. He answers well. Karaboshi Haruki is armed with horns and begins to recalculate their value. After a while, she hands Karaboshi Haruki and Karen the cards and tells them, thank you for waiting. On the cards, the payment for 53 horns, as well as the remaining amount of 50% for 48 horns are transferred to their accounts. The girl with glasses behind her was twisted with anger. Karaboshi Haruki and Karen leave, hearing the cry of thank you. Karaboshi Haruki looks back at the store and thinks that it was definitely a girl from that store. After Karaboshi Haruki and Karen have left, the girl with glasses shouts to Yuyujuki Akane who is still bowing, what the hell is she allowing herself? Yuyujuki Akane replies to her that she wanted to ask her the same thing, and then she shouts loudly that it was a very important client. She continues, telling the girl that even if she is going to obey every word of the boss, only the buyer brings money. So sometimes you can turn a blind eye to the orders of the boss. Does the girl really not understand that she is being rude to the boss and to customers? The girl replies to Yuyujuki Akane that she will report her prank to her superiors today. Yuyujuki Akane leans against the counter and, closing her eyes, says well, okay, she doesn't care. The day will come when the girl will thank her. She turns away from her and says yes, yes, of course. Yuyujuki Akane smiles. Karaboshi Haruki approaches his car and says he is not on foot. Karen runs up to him and calling him, asks how she can thank him. He didn't quite understand her question. And later, Karaboshi Haruki replies to Karen that there is no need for any gratitude. He wanted to save her, and he saved her. Karen replies that she wants to thank him. Karen replies that if she can somehow repay Karaboshi Haruki, no matter what, please just let him tell her what she needs to do. Karaboshi Haruki looks at her in shock. He doesn't quite understand the meaning of Karen's words. He freezes, thinking that Karen does not mean what he thought. Out of pure gratitude. That's what Karen's lips said. This girl and him together. Karaboshi Haruki quickly jumps into the car and yells at Karen not to sweat and forget about it. He immediately starts moving quickly. Karen looks after his car in shock. Later, Karaboshi Haruki returns home. He opens the door and enters his apartment. He thinks wearily that he is not sure that he would have reached home today. Karaboshi Haruki collapses on the bed and says that he is so tired. And then, lying on the pillow, he understands something. He stands up and touches his face. He screams damn. He was wearing a mask the whole time and I completely forgot about her. Karaboshi Haruki understands that this is why the guy at the reception was so scared, and Karaboshi Haruki rode away without even thinking about it. It's all creep. His appearance definitely looked mega creepy. Karaboshi Haruki removes the mask from his face. Karaboshi Haruki looks at the mask in his hands and thinks that, however, while he was wearing the mask, he didn't worry about anything, as if it was all in a dream. He remembers the girl's reaction to his appearance and thinks that no one ever notices him. He seems to be more transparent than air. 
but today they finally paid attention to him, and he was able to feel that he exists. Kariboshi Haruki says what a cool thing this mask is. Later, Kariboshi Haruki comes to a strong tavern. There are a lot of people there, everyone is drinking and chatting. Kariboshi Haruki is sitting at the table, clutching a glass in his hands. He is squeezed on both sides by people who do not notice him. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that he finally decided to come to this popular tavern, which is so often written about on forums. Kariboshi Haruki puts the mug on the table and thinks that one mug of beer here costs 2,000 yen. But today is a special day. But Kariboshi Haruka's thoughts are interrupted by his neighbor who raises his hand and shouts accept the order. He pushes Haruki's Kariboshi without noticing him, and he pours his beer. The man turns his head and referring to Kariboshi Haruki says that he is such a soft wall. No one notices Haruka's Kariboshi at all. Then another guy comes up to the man and tells him that he saw that guy in a weird mask today. They start discussing that they both saw this guy with a dagger. Kariboshi Haruki, all stained with beer, looks at them with interest and listens to their conversation. The guys are discussing that the guy in the mask is not pulling for a beginner. He was dressed so strangely, and even in this weird mask. Such a jerk. Kariboshi Haruki looks at his beer glass and squeezes it hard. He thinks that this is it. His eyes fill with tears. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that strangers have seen him and they are discussing him. He is so happy about this fact. Kariboshi Haruki abruptly gets up and shouts loudly that he needs more beer. He scares people sitting next to him with such a sharp call who had not noticed him before and were surprised that there was a person next to them all this time. To himself, Kuraboshi Haruki thinks that he needs a drink for the fact that he has ceased to be more transparent than air. And immediately a waitress comes up to him from behind and says that she brought an order for an empty seat. She, like everyone else, does not notice Haruka's Kuraboshi. He is very upset by this fact. He says that he should probably go back to the hotel. He's watching a post about fighting a monster parade. And with a smile, he says that today he will have great content. This will definitely attract an audience. He thinks about Karen and thinks that by the way that girl said that she also runs a blog. Kariboshi Haruki finds Karen's blog on the internet. She posted a post titled, I was saved. It begins with the words that she will never forgive those adventurers, and thank you very much to the one who saved her. Kariboshi Haruki reads these words with a smile, and then his eyes open in shock. He sees that Karen has 14 posts, they have been bookmarked 1043 times. Kariboshi Haruki puts down the phone and with tears in his eyes thinks that it's time for him to sleep. Here begins the discussion and the private chat escape from the monster parade. There are already more than 500 comments. Part of them, it looks like a divorce. God, what an idiot. You can't just break into a monster parade and then go home and write a post about it. And this adventurer exists at all. It seems to someone that this is a lie but he feels so sorry for this adventurer. He understood that there was another blogger with him. Someone couldn't get in touch with nothing. Ignore, ignore. Nothing is an adventurer's nickname. Someone decides to subscribe to his updates. For sure it's a ranger who was banned. Someone also decides to subscribe. By the way, none of the readers even saw this guy. How did they find out his nickname? When morning comes, Kariboshi Haruki opens his laptop in shock and looks at the screen. He is shocked to think that this is really serious. His post has 5 views, and he has 3 people and bookmarks. Kariboshi Haruki happily opens the curtains, thinking that finally, this is the first time someone has added it to bookmarks. They noticed him. The existence of Kariboshi Haruka has finally been noticed by someone. Kariboshi Haruki puts the mask in his bag and thinks that okay, it's time for him to get ready to go home. He thinks it's worth going down to the dungeon, raising the level, and then. But then he freezes and thinks in shock that no, he can't go home. He remembers those three adventurers and Karen and thinks that he needs to find that girl. Hell, she has a blog. He can just text her. After all, it will be difficult to find her here. Kariboshi Haruki walks in a crowd of people and thinks about it. But then he bumps into Karen, who recognizes him and comes up to him with a smile looking at him. Kariboshi Haruki is shocked that she recognized him and noticed him. He looks at her in shock and surprise. Karen says good morning to him. Kariboshi Haruki replies good morning to her. And then he asks Karen that she saw him, but he hadn't even called out to her. To himself, Kariboshi Haruki thinks that, in general, for the first time in his life, someone called him. Karen tells Kariboshi Haruki with a smile that it's all his mask. She stands out so much. Kariboshi Haruki is shocked to think that he forgot that he was wearing his mask. He touches his face in disbelief, happily thinking that this mask is just super. He remembers the smiling saleswoman and thinks that he gave only 500 yen for such a cool mask. That saleswoman should have a monument erected. 
Karen looks at his strange actions and asks Kariboshi Haruka if everything is okay. He looks very excited. Kariboshi Haruki answers her exactly. And then he says what about those adventurers? But then he hears a strange sound behind him. He turns around, and Karen, looking in the same direction as him, calls his name. He looks at Kashima, Lars and Haria. Kariboshi Haruki realizes that these are the same guys and calls Karen. She doesn't understand what he wants from her. And Kariboshi Haruki asks her not to go anywhere. He thinks about what he knew. Kashima, Lars and Haria came to check if Karen had survived. If they saw that she was alive, then so that she wouldn't tell anyone the truth, they would threaten her, and maybe they would kill Karen. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about how adventurers, although no, as the people of Kashima, Lars and Haria, it's time to answer. Kashima, Lars and Haria look at Haruki Kariboshi in a mask and shout that this can't be. They take up fighting positions and prepare for battle. Kashima, Lars and Haria, right in the crowd, rush to attack Haruki and Karen's Kariboshi. She's terrified and Kariboshi Haruki thinks that it can't be. He also takes a fighting stance. He thinks that Kashima is rushing at him with his shield right here, with a huge number of people. And what does it have to do with a little girl? What do they think at all? Kariboshi Haruki looks at his opponents and thinks that if he dodges the shield, an arrow will fly after him. And if he copes with an archer, then he will be attacked with a sword after him. Kariboshi Haruki thinks he needs to take a closer look. There must be a way out. But Kashima has already approached him and is attacking. Kariboshi Haruki is shocked to think that he is moving so fast. And then Kashima throws himself at him with a sword with a smile. But then someone gets between Haruki's Kariboshi and Kashima and destroys Kashima's weapon with his sword. He lets it out of his hand in shock. Kashima flies off to the side after his weapon. Kariboshi Haruki looks at all this in shock. The swordsman standing between them with a stern look asks them about what the hell they have arranged here. Kashima, on the other hand, looks at the swordsman in shock, lying on the ground and opening his mouth. Kariboshi Haruki also looks at this warrior in shock. Then someone shouts that it's Masatsugu Sam. Karen looks at him the same way. All the people around open their mouths in admiration and grab their phones. Kariboshi Haruki is thinking about when Masatsugu Sam will already appear between them. He couldn't even catch his movements. Karen shouts to Masatsugu Sam that these people are, but she is interrupted by Kashima who shouts to masatsugu san that Kariboshi Haruki and Karen attacked them first. They set a parade of monsters on them, and they thought they were finished. Hearing this, Kariboshi Haruki gets angry and thinks about what kind of adventurers have gone. People immediately start discussing that Kariboshi Haruki and Karen abandoned their comrades during the monster parade. This is generally Tim. Masatsuki-san looks at Kariboshi Haruki and sternly asks him if this is true. Kariboshi Haruki puts his hand on Karen and answers him no. These guys went to the dungeon with this girl, but came across a parade of monsters. Then these guys dumped Karen to buy time. She looks at Masatsuki-san with sadness. He says that everything is clear and immediately asks Karen that she had a hard time. Really? Wars shouts in shock that. They immediately all three of them start shouting to Masatsuki-san that he really believed the words of this guy. They risked their lives here. Masatsuki-san replies that it doesn't matter if he believes or not. He turns to three adventurers and says that they did not raise a weapon on a person, so their opinion does not mean anything. Kashima shouts to Masatsugi-san that since he started talking about weapons, he should take a look at this guy. Just by looking at Haruki's Kariboshi, you can understand that it was self-defense. Then two police officers approach them, and Haruki asks Kashima what they will do when the police are interested in what he is doing. Then the police officers notice Masatsugi-san. And then they excitedly shout while they are his fans. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about how, as expected, the police will sort everything out. The police start asking Masatsugi-san about what happened here, and he tells them. Karen asks Kariboshi Haruka what went well after all, because yes, he replies that it would be great if that was the end of it. After a while, the police officers take Lars, Kashima and Haruki away. Someone says that the police took them away without explanation without questions. They are indebted to Masatsugu-san for helping them deal with this trio. Here Masatsugu-san pays attention to Haruki's Kariboshi and says oh, yes. He approaches Kariboshi Haruki and asks him about his name. He is shocked that Masatsuki-san addressed him, as well as Karen standing next to him. Kariboshi Haruki replies to Masatsuki-san, giving his name, and says that his nickname on the site is nothing. Masatsuki-san answers him with a smile that that's how it is. And then he adds that nothing-san is quite strong. Kariboshi Haruki in shock says ah, such words are somehow unexpected. He thinks to himself that this is sarcasm or a compliment. 
but why did Masatsuki san say such words? In response, he tells Kariboshi Haruki that because he was not afraid of such a situation, probably because of the fact that Kariboshi Haruki spends a lot of time in the dungeon. This has become a habit for him, hasn't it? Kariboshi Haruki, closing his eyes, thinks that this is really becoming a habit. Masatsuki san tells Kariboshi Haruki that at the moment, of all the people he has met, he is the most inconspicuous. It's just an amazing skill. Kariboshi Haruki shouts that this is not the case, but thank you for such words. Masatsuki-san narrows his eyes and tells Kariboshi Haruki that he also has a kind look. He comes very close to Kariboshi Haruki and looks into his eyes through the slit in the mask. Masatsuki-san leans over to Kariboshi Haruki and tells him in his ear that it would be better for him if he did not appear in the city for a while. Kariboshi Haruki asks him about the fact that an attempt will be made on him. Masatsuki-san replies that it's not out of the question. He points his finger behind his back and says that he will deal with this trio for now. Kariboshi Haruki replies to Masatsugu-san that he doesn't want to bother him with it. He replies to Kariboshi Haruki that if people decide that all adventurers are like that, then everyone else may have problems. And Masatsugi-san would be in trouble too, if people thought he was the same as these three. Masatsugi-san says that he will be in Sapporo for a while anyway. Kariboshi Haruki asks about what it is like. Then he can leave it to Masatsugi-san. He replies that of course, this trio is rotten through and through, so we need to do something about it. Well, in principle, they understood each other. Kariboshi Haruki leaves the crowd. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the tablet and thinks that he is looking for someone's status for the first time. Besides, Masatsugi-san is a top ranger, and this, this is a very rare chance. Now Kariboshi Haruki knows exactly who he will look up to. Kariboshi Haruki is learning the skills and characteristics of Masatsuga-san. Kariboshi Haruki in shock shouts off, What? How is Masatsuga-san Ranka exactly? He's a top ranger, and even with the divine Shinigami armor. If Masatsugi-san has divine armor, then God himself helps him. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that he needs more information, but then the button from his panel disappears. Kariboshi Haruki looks around the corner and thinks that Masatsugu-san must have left. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that Masatsugu-san has disappeared from the range of the tablet, so she disappeared. He wanted to know more about divine protection. Well, at least I had time to consider the basic skills of Masatsugu-san. Then Karen comes up to him, who says that she has finally found him. She turns to Kariboshi Haruki and asks him to please take her with him to the dungeon. Kariboshi Haruki looks at her in shock. Karen says that she means the one Masatsugu-san was talking about, the other. The dungeon that Kariboshi Haruka has at home. He is shocked by her words. He immediately says the weather. He thinks to himself about how Karen knows about this. She tells Kariboshi Haruki that he said that his nickname is nothing, right? She found it online. Kariboshi Haruki is the same nothing-san who wrote the article I have a dungeon at home. Kariboshi Haruki answers ooh. Karen says that when she has free time, she reads the latest added articles on the forum. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that one of his readers is standing in front of him. How unusual it all is. Karen asks Kariboshi Haruka with a smile, so they're off. He answers her no, we have to wait. There is absolutely nothing interesting in his town. Karen asks Kariboshi Haruka that there is a dungeon there. Kariboshi Haruki answers yes, but it's very far from here. There's a noble wilderness. He asks Karen if her parents won't be worried about her. Karen answers him very sadly that everything is fine. Kariboshi Haruki doesn't know what to say to this and is silent. After a while he tells Karen okay. She smiles and looks at him. Kariboshi Haruki gets behind the wheel, and Karen sits next to him. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that this girl is definitely an adventurer. Karen decided to risk her life just like him and try your best. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that Karen seems to know the feeling of losing something very valuable. Out loud he says okay, they're going to the dungeon. And Kariboshi Haruki and Karen are leaving. Karen happily looks out the window, and a few minutes later her gaze changes. She says that where they came to is really a remote place. Kariboshi Haruki laughs. Then they arrive at the garage of Kariboshi Haruka. Karen looks admiringly in front of her and says wow, the dungeon is right in his garage. Karen says it must be really cool to have a dungeon next to the house. Kariboshi Haruki replies that sort of. Karen says here that she remembered, and asks Kariboshi Haruka about where you can sell all sorts of things here. 
but she is interrupted by Karaboshi Haruki and answers her that nowhere. There's nothing here. Karen realizes that they are in the wilderness. Karen asks about the fact that there is not even a gun shop here. Karaboshi Haruki asks Karen not to look at him like that, and not to ask him stupid questions. Karaboshi Haruki continues, saying that you can't even order anything from an online store here. Karen says that there is a dungeon here. Karaboshi Haruki replies that it's at least something good here. He asks Karen, well, they're coming. Karaboshi Haruki goes down the steps and asks Karaboshi Haruki if she knows what monsters live here. She replies that she is a Scalopendra and asks if this is true. Karaboshi Haruki answers her yes and says that she seems to have read his blog carefully. He asks Karen not to worry, saying that Scalopendra is not dangerous. But they can break her armor so Karen should be careful. She replies that she understood everything. Karaboshi Haruki looks at her and thinks that her armor is just clothes with a cape and Karen's weapon is a staff made of a root, and she also has leather boots. The staff from the root destroys the materials that can be obtained from the defeated monster, so it is not popular among adventurers. In addition, it is very difficult to communicate with the Model B from the company Banma. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that Karen is a maniac, since she reads all the latest blog updates, but at the same time she chose far from the best weapon. Karaboshi Haruki thinks it's very interesting. He decides that he will have to ask Karen about it. Then a huge Scalopendra approaches them. Karen is shocked and looks at her in horror. Karaboshi Haruki, looking at her reaction, tells Karen that everything is fine. The Scalopendras are very weak. Karen trembling says that her heart almost stopped. Karaboshi Haruki tells Karen that this is a rare opportunity. Let her kill the insect. He steps on the monster with his foot. Karaboshi Haruki asks Karen about what she is waiting for. Karen screams in horror. Karaboshi Haruki tells her that the weak point of the Scalopendra is the head. Karen shouts to Karaboshi Haruki why he is doing it so calmly. He doesn't understand her reaction. Karen also shouts at him a question about whether he is disgusted. Karaboshi Haruki replies that the Scalopendras are cute. Karen shouts in shock that. Karaboshi Haruki asks her to look, saying that after all, the Scalopendra moves its paws so cool. And yet, Karen interrupts him, shouting to him, please stop, or she will die of goosebumps. Karaboshi Haruki asks Karen that when a terrible monster appears, she will also look away from him. Karaboshi Haruki tells Karen that the Scalopendra won't kill her, but another monster will do it with ease. If Karen turns away because she is against it, then she is finished. Whether she understood it or not, Karen is almost crying. And Karaboshi Haruki continues, telling her that she is a little girl who is afraid of every bug or an adventurer who faces danger. Karaboshi Haruki asks Karen who she is. Karen tightens her grip on her weapon and goes to Karaboshi Haruki and Scalopendra. He raises his staff to strike, trembling all over, and immediately lowers his weapon right on the head of the Scalopendra. Later, Karen turns away, covering her mouth as she vomits. Karaboshi Haruki looks at her and thinks that raising the level is not very pleasant. After a while, Karen wipes her mouth and asks Karaboshi Haruki about how long ago he became an adventurer. Karaboshi Haruki replies that he became an adventurer this year. Karen happily shouts that she too. Karaboshi Haruki replies that that's how it is, of course. Karen asks Karaboshi Haruka if he has ever practiced martial arts. Karaboshi Haruki answers her no. When he was a student, he only studied and worked, that's all. Karaboshi Haruki thinks to himself that when he started working, it turned out that his company was dark. Dark companies are companies that mistreat their employees, driving them with overwork and stress. Karen looks at Haruki's Karaboshi and says that's why he's so strong and she's not. Karaboshi Haruki closes his eyes and thinks. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that in his opinion, it's all thanks to his equipment. He tells Karen that his dungeon is always open, so Karen can hunt here as much as she wants. When Karen kills a few more Scalopendras, she will also become stronger. Karen replies with a smile that then she will try to exterminate them all. Karaboshi Haruki tells her no, and asks her not to overdo it. Karen rushes into battle on Scalopender, dealing with several at once. She falls to the ground, dropping her staff. Karaboshi Haruki turns to her. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that according to his calculations, Karen has already defeated the hundred Scalopendra. She calmly copes with them alone, but he is still afraid to leave her alone. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that although the pumping speed is different from his speed, apparently his accelerated growth skill is making itself felt. Karen apologizes to him and says they should take a break. Karaboshi Haruki answers her yes, of course. Karen leans against the dungeon wall, sweating and trembling. She falls against the wall without strength and covers her eyes, taking water out of her backpack. Karaboshi Haruki looks at her and thinks that she is amazing. Karen has never complained about anything. 
She is quite brave and is not afraid of difficult work. He decides to help Karen a little. He opens the characteristics of Karen in the panel. She sits and trembles thinking that maybe all these scolopendras will appear to her in dreams. Teraboshi Haruki studies her characteristics and opens her eyes in shock, thinking that it's the same. Teraboshi Haruki thinks that Karen has magical skills in her characteristics. So Karen knows how to use magic. Kariboshi Haruki looks at Karen and thinks that magic has not been fully studied, so little is known about her. Almost all adventurers dream of mastering this skill, and one of the owners of this skill is right in front of Kariboshi Haruki right now. He clenches his fists, thinking that he really wants to know more about Karen, and he really wants to see Karen in action. He is directly captured by the thirst for knowledge. Kariboshi Haruki looks at Karen again and thinks that she is hiding her skills, which means that she is trying not to use magic. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that Karen is just like him. Beginners very often harm others because they do not know how to use their skills, and it is very dangerous to share information with outsiders. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that it would be necessary to gently hint to Karen. He's calling Karen Sam. She turns her head to him, and Kariboshi Haruki says that he wanted to ask, and immediately asks Karen if she owns magic. Karen, after his questions, forcefully squeezes her staff, and in response asks Kariboshi Haruki a question about why he asks her about it. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that shit. Why does he ask his question so directly? Karen looks at him warily. Kariboshi Haruki immediately puts his hands in front of him in defense, and tells Karen that her equipment. It just seemed to him that Karen looked like a magical girl with him. Karen tells Kariboshi Haruki that the sorceress girls wear dresses. In response, he asks if this is true. He didn't know. He says that he meant that they just say that if someone has a magical weapon, then there must be magical abilities, right? Kariboshi Haruki continues, saying that he thought that since they go together, they could talk about their skills. Karen tells him that even if someone owns her, she doesn't think about what the person will say about it until she reaches an advanced level. Kariboshi Haruki asks Karen why she thinks so. She answers him because it's dangerous. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that as he knew, Karen is defending herself and she is well informed. Kariboshi Haruki thinks well, and he looks at the panel again. Kariboshi Haruki studies it and thinks about whether there is any benefit from the luck skill or not. But he doesn't have it, which means that maybe this skill has something to do with magical abilities. Kariboshi Haruki presses something on the panel, thinking that in some sense it looks like a lottery. Karen looks at his back and thinks about what he's doing, and then she starts shaking. Haruki Kariboshi is also shaking. He thinks it's an earthquake. Haruki and Karen Kariboshi freeze. And then Kariboshi Haruki says that it's not good, they need to get out. Karen supports his decision. They start running towards the exit. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that the sound is like something collapsing. He thinks about what if it's a parade of monsters of domestic scolopendras, so they are unlikely to be able to kill them if there are many of them. Here a giant scolopendra gets in the way of Haruka and Karen Kariboshi. She appears after the 8th floor. It can easily kill them, and is extremely poisonous. The giant scolopendra is not only very fast, but also has an excellent sense of smell. Kariboshi Haruki opens his eyes in shock, looking at the giant scolopendra and thinks about what they are doing here. They're on the ground floor. The monster immediately sweeps between Haruki's Kariboshi and Karen. Kariboshi Haruki immediately throws himself in front of Karen and shouts at her to get behind him, and he shouts at her to cover his back. Karen wants to say something, but doesn't have time. The monster launches an attack, and Kariboshi Haruki shouts at Karen from behind. Giant Scolopendras do not appear here. This is a very rare monster. Rare species rarely appear. These are mutants. They can be stronger than the boss. Kariboshi Haruki attacks the giant Sclopendra in the head, but he does not break through the monster's shell. Kariboshi Haruki in anger thinks that the insect has a strong armor. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that damn. When a giant Scolopendra, taking advantage of his weakness, jumps on him and attacks him. Kariboshi Haruki closes his eyes when the monster opens its mouth. But then the giant Scolopendra is attacked by magic. This is Karen, who uses magic to defeat the monster. Later they come out of the dungeon and Karen happily says wow. She looks at the setting sun and says how beautiful it is. And Kariboshi Haruki finds himself thinking that he never thought about it. Here Kariboshi Haruki notices some kind of structure. He comes up with Karen and sees that it says, We sell and buy equipment and materials. Kariboshi Haruki says that they really decided. Karen tells him that when they went down to the dungeon, there was no store yet. It's unbelievable. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that usually before opening a store, companies conduct an assessment of the area by the number of people and their purchasing power. 
and not just take and open a store in the wilderness where two people live. And this store looks very strange. Kariboshi Haruki says that in any case, he is glad that they have opened. They just have some materials, so they will sell them right away. Kariboshi Haruki opens the door of the store and says sorry. There's that girl behind the counter, a saleswoman named Yuyujuki Akane. She is in a strange state and says welcome, they have few goods, but they can look around please. Yuyujuki Akane, looking around the empty store, thinks that they have nothing at all. Kariboshi Haruki asks Yuyujuki Akane that she is the same saleswoman from the store in Sapporo. The girl has tears in her eyes. She takes her head in her hands and screams loudly with tears in her eyes about why she was sent here. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about what the girl said here twice. He turns around and leaving says that they will come back later. He thinks to himself that the girl has changed since their last meeting. But Yuyujuki Akane stops him, saying that he really should leave the crying girl alone. Kariboshi Haruki is thinking about how fast a girl is. She sits down on the counter and wiping her tears says that she has done so much for this company. Is this not discrimination against women? She asks Kariboshi Haruki and Karen that isn't it cruel. They agree with her, it's true. Kariboshi Haruki, sitting in front of her, replies yeah. Yuyujuki Akane continues, saying that even though her sales have increased, it's simply because she got involved in another store's business. Kariboshi Haruki asks her if she was demoted. Yuyujuki Akane grabs him by the shoulders asking him to please not say it out loud. He answers her okay. She turns away from them, and Kariboshi Haruki asks her about how she will buy their materials from them. She angrily turns to Haruki Kariboshi and shouts that she will buy it. After all, just because she was sent to hell does not mean that she is incompetent. Kariboshi Haruki looks at her and thinks about why she looks like she's about to hit him. Yuyujuki Akane puts on gloves and asks about what they have here, centipede shells and a giant centipede. Yuyujuki Akane counts the goods and says that there are 96 shells of domestic centipedes, each worth 1000 yen. But about the shells of the giant scolopendra, Yuyujuki Akane asks Haruki Kariboshi if he is sure that he wants to sell it. He asks her what she means. Yuyujuki Akane tells him that the armor made from the shell of a giant Sklopendra is much better than Yuyujuki Akane's armor. Since he already has the materials, it will cost less than buying it from scratch. Yuyujuki Akane says that no, he is selling it. Yuyujuki Akane asks him why. Kariboshi Haruki replies that he barely escaped today. He remembers Yuyujuki Akane telling him that if his level is too low, then his equipment will not accept him and he will not be able to use it. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that first he needs to become stronger. Yuyujuki Akane tells him that then they should keep a couple of pieces and she will buy the rest. He looks at her in shock. Yuyujuki Akane replies that there may come a time when he might need them, and he sold them all. Kariboshi Haruki answers her clearly. He thinks to himself that Yuyujuki Akane is a good person even if she doesn't think so herself. Yuyujuki Akane says that in the end, eight giant centipede shells will cost 40,000 yen, and together with the shells of domestic centipedes, the price is 138,000 yen. She asks Kariboshi Haruka if everything suits him. He tells her yes. Kariboshi Haruki tells the girls that they can still divide everything in half. She answers him well. Karen immediately shouts wait. She yells at Kariboshi Haruka that he should take more. He tells her that she helped him kill these centipedes. Karen tells Haruki's Kariboshi that she was only able to hunt them because of him. She would never have learned this alone. Kariboshi Haruki doesn't know what to answer. The girl tells Kariboshi Haruka and Karen that they should finally decide. She was arguing about the same thing yesterday. Kariboshi Haruki asks her if she can close her mouth for a minute. She responds by asking them if they should hurry up. Kariboshi Haruki offers Karen the option that she will take half and in return she will answer him a couple of questions. Karen looks down and says okay. Yuyujuki Akane asks them about something they haven't decided yet. She says that the evening sun is so bright here, she can't stand it, covering the windows with wooden boards. Kariboshi Haruki looks at her and thinks that this girl, it seems that she is bad at everything except work. Yuyujuki Akane counts the amount, and then Kariboshi Haruki says that he still needs to evaluate something. The girl asks to let her look, he places a bag in front of her, covered in something slimy. Karen covers her mouth and screams Yuwa. Kariboshi Haruki tells the girl that it fell out of the centipede's stomach while they were collecting materials. Yuyujuki Akane tells him that he talks about it so calmly. He remembers how he looked in fascination at the find, and Karen screamed in horror. Yuyujuki Akane examines the bag and asks Kariboshi Haruka what kind of assessment he needs, simple or detailed. 
He responds by asking what the difference is. Yuyuki Akane replies that with a simple assessment, she will do it herself. It will take about a minute and cost 1000 yen. A detailed assessment will be carried out in the laboratory. There will be different equipment used, and all this can take about a month depending on the complexity. It will cost 100,000 yen. Kariboshi Haruki thoughtfully says a month, 100,000 yen. Yuujuki Akane tells him yes. This will all be carried out by their experts in the Mitsubishi laboratory. Kariboshi Haruki says okay. This time they will make do with a simple assessment. Obviously this is a magical thing. Yuujuki Akane smiles and tells him I understand. She takes the thing in her hands and says that it is magical and in the shape of a bag. She puts her hand in it. And then Yuujuki Akane tells Kariboshi Haruki that he congratulates him. This really is a magic bag. It seems small, but things larger than 20 centimeters will fit in there. The interior inside resembles a school classroom. She asks Kariboshi Haruka if he wants to sell her. He starts saying, I'm sorry, but I don't want. Yeah. Yuujuki Akane interrupts him, saying that he will buy the bag from him for a hundred million. Kariboshi Haruki, in shock, asks her for one billion. Yuujuki Akane asks him why he is surprised. Now the prices for transporting goods are simply off the charts. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about what exactly. If you invest these hundred million in some company, but. He says out loud that one hundred million is of course good. But they will keep the bag for themselves. Yuujuki Akane replies that yes, she thinks it is the right decision. Later, Karen enters the room where Haruki Kariboshi is standing. She looks around and says this is his house. Karen happily says, oh, laptop. Kariboshi Haruki replies that few people have a computer these days. He has solar panels at home, so he can easily use electricity. Karen tells Kariboshi Haruka that she is so jealous of him. Large homes usually have restrictions on electricity consumption. Kariboshi Haruki asks about that prices have now risen. He invites Karen to sit at the table. She thanks him. Karen looks at the glass in front of her with tears in her eyes. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that she can drink. She takes the glass and drinks. Kariboshi Haruki asks her if the water tastes good. She's from his well. Karen tells him with a smile that yes, the water is very tasty. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen that after this, she will no longer be able to drink tap water. Karen tells Haruki Kariboshi that he wanted to talk to her about something. He answers accurately and asks Karen what it means she can use magic. She tells him yes and apologizes for hiding it from him. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen that he believes it was the right decision. It will be dangerous if someone else finds out about it and will not be interested. Karen asks why it's not interesting. Kariboshi Haruki replies that they are adventurers because they have such a fun life filled with adventures and battles with monsters, aren't they? Karen tells Haruki Kariboshi that he seems to have overplayed his game. He tells her that perhaps this is so, but he thinks she would be better off using magic. There is no one else in this dungeon except them, so Karen can safely use it. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen that if she uses magic constantly, her abilities will increase, and even if Karen finds herself in a situation like today, she can easily cope with it. He thinks to himself that he also wants to look at it. Karen replies that she understands, and then from tomorrow she will start using magic. Kariboshi Haruki asks Karen if she can use magic now. Karen asks for forgiveness and says that magic is difficult to use outside the dungeon. Kariboshi Haruki answers clearly. He asks Karen about how long she has been using magic. She tells him that she doesn't know. She continues, saying that while she was walking around the dungeon, she had a feeling that maybe everything would work out for her. And when she took the staff with one hand, Kariboshi Haruki replies that he understood. And since then Karen has been using this staff. She says yes, and she says that it's easier for her to control magic. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about her answer. He thinks about what it means that the dungeon itself has magic. Magic accumulates in the staff, after which Karen releases it. Karen asks Haruka Kariboshi that he only wanted to talk about this. He answers that yes, yes. Kariboshi Haruki pours water and asks Karen another question about where she is going to sleep tonight. She answers with a smile that she is here. Kariboshi Haruki is shocked by her answer and pours water into his glass so that it splashes out. Karen looks at him with a smile, and Haruki Kariboshi loudly shouts what? Kariboshi Haruki tell Karen that he didn't hear. He asks Karen again where she is going to spend the night. In response, she asks Kariboshi Haruki a question about how he has another room, right? He replies that yes, but... Karen immediately says that then she will stay. Kariboshi Haruki immediately shouts at her, no, 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 no. Karen replies that everything is fine. She won't be scared, even if he has a whole collection of creepy masks there. Kariboshi Haruki shouts that they are not there. 
and to himself he thinks that Karen really doesn't understand that she is barely an adult girl. Kariboshi Haruki takes off his mask, and Karen looks at him and thinks that this is the first time she sees his face. He asks Karen-san if she understands where they are. She replies that yes, they are at his house. Kariboshi Haruki replies that yes, but not only that. This house is located next to the dungeon and if monsters suddenly break out of it, they will destroy his house first. And Kariboshi Haruki is the only adventurer in the area, and if not him, then who will stand up to protect this village? Karen asks Kariboshi Haruka that he lives here alone, right? He tells her that he still has to be on guard right. After all, an adventurer's job is to protect people, and since there are two of them here, one of them must monitor the entrance to the dungeon and the second must prepare a shelter for people in case of an emergency. Therefore, Kuraboshi Haruki wants Karen to go to the hotel and prepare a safe place there. She lowers her head and speaks clearly. Kuraboshi Haruki looks at her and smiles. He thinks to himself that he is saved. After all, in villages rumors spread very quickly, and all the other residents might mistake him for some kind of pervert. People will hate and despise him without even understanding the situation. Kuraboshi Haruki tells Karen that okay, they have decided everything. There is a hotel nearby, the room costs 5,000 yen per night. He'll take Karen. She tells him thank you. After that, for the next three days, he and Karen hunted Scolopendra in the dungeon. They killed hundreds of centipedes every day, and at the end of each day they sold materials. Karen got the hang of it pretty quickly and now can easily handle two or three centipedes alone. And the power of Karen's magic also increased. And what about Kariboshi Haruka? He studies his stats and thinks about how his blade skill level has increased without him even putting points into it. He wonders if this level is really growing on its own. He thinks in shock that it was even possible. It looks like his skills are growing as he hunts monsters. This is very cool. Then Karen notices the centipede and shouts to Kariboshi Haruka that this monster is hers. She deals with the insect. Kariboshi Haruki approaches her and says that this is already the hundredth. Karen turns to him and says she's not tired yet. Haruki's Kariboshi tells her no, that's enough for today. They need to rest and continue tomorrow. Karen asks how he is doing. Kariboshi Haruki replies that he also needs to level up. Karen immediately apologizes to Kariboshi Haruka, saying that he was just covering for her all this time. He tells Karen that she doesn't need to apologize. They'll just take tomorrow off. Karen tells him that she understands. She tells Kariboshi Haruki that if he goes further, then she would like to. But Kariboshi Haruki interrupts her, telling her to rest, because even God rests once a week. She sadly answers okay. Kariboshi Haruki goes into the dungeon and says that it has been a long time since he went here alone. He thinks to himself that he doesn't want to be inferior to Karen in terms of strength. They really do need to take a day off from time to time. For an adventurer, his moral and physical condition is his everything, and including being prepared for dangers. Kariboshi Haruki passes the first floor. After all, danger is also part of the adventurer's job. Kariboshi Haruki also goes through the second floor. On the third floor he also finds nothing interesting. Kariboshi Haruki wonders if he can reach the fourth. Then he notices a raccoon ahead. This is a black raccoon. He's very fast. He has powerful claws. He comes from the Tanuki monster. The black raccoon immediately opens its fanged mouth and rushes to attack Haruki's Kariboshi. He thinks in shock about how fast the monster is. The raccoon is much faster than the killer rabbit. But that doesn't mean that Kariboshi Haruki can't handle him. He draws his dagger and enters into battle with the monster. And somehow, Kariboshi Haruki still won. He decides that it's time to end this battle and deals with the black raccoon. He managed to defeat about a hundred of them and Kariboshi Haruki raised six levels, and his backpack is now full of tanuki meat. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that when he returns home, he will make tanuki soup. Kariboshi Haruki says that now that this is all over, he will go to the fourth floor. Then Kariboshi Haruki walks and thinks that the boss of the floor is in front of him. This is a huge black raccoon. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the monster and thinks that it doesn't even have assistance. He can do it easily. The beast rushes to attack him. Kariboshi Haruki attacks the monster, but it repels his attack. And then the raccoon wounds Haruki's Kariboshi with a blow of its paw. But Kariboshi Haruki still defeats the monster. He leans towards the raccoon and immediately notices that the dungeon is shining. Kariboshi Haruki says that he understands why. He read about it on wiki. This appears to mean defeating the boss. Kariboshi Haruki says that he is sure that he should get something for defeating the boss. And then the body of the raccoon boss disappears. Kariboshi Haruki shouts that he didn't collect the materials, and the boss's body was swallowed up by the dungeon. 
but then he notices that instead of a raccoon, something remains. Kiraboshi Haruki takes the finds in his hands and says that it is a large raccoon claw, and seems to be iron. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks that this is left from the boss. Maybe it's some kind of rare iron. He decides that the iron will need to be evaluated. Kiraboshi Haruki happily says that's it. It's time for him to go to the fourth floor. Kiraboshi Haruki opens the panel and does not understand why his points have not increased. But there must be some requirements. Kiraboshi Haruki opens the information and reads that for the first list for each floor below, he receives one skill point. When defeating a rare monster, he receives one skill point. When killing a boss, he does not receive skill points. He does not gain skill points for killing a regular monster. Skills can grow without investing additional skill points into them. Kiraboshi Haruki says so that's what it's all about. Then he notices that something new has appeared in his characteristics. He got an imitation. It helps imitate the movements of the enemy. It is a fighting style that appears spontaneously. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks that this is very interesting. But for now he will not begin to upgrade this skill. Kiraboshi Haruki says that now it's time for him to go down to the fourth floor. He comes and says wow, how beautiful it is all around. Dark green? No, it has some light inclusions. Kiraboshi Haruki looks around and thinks that he wonders what color he will have in the color palette. It will probably be difficult to repeat it. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks that this is all because of his work at the publishing house. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks it's probably just a professional change. Then Kiraboshi Haruki notices a growing flower. He catches himself thinking that he seems to have seen these before. Then the flower begins to change and Kiraboshi Haruki does not understand what it was. And then the flower turns into a potato, which shoots at Kiraboshi Haruki. He jumps to the side and looks at the vegetable. Kiraboshi Haruki finds himself thinking about how beautiful his dungeon is. It contains meat, potatoes, and onions. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks that if he can complete this dungeon, then he can make himself some rice and curry. The flower continues to shoot potatoes, and then fades. Kiraboshi Haruki stands with a bag and asks about the fact that the flower only has 40 charges. He thinks about what good the plant is if it can't give him more potatoes. And then a huge flower appears. Kiraboshi Haruki folds his hands on his chest and thinks that the boss of the fourth floor is a huge potato. And then all the flowers attack him. He screams about what the hell. They decided to attack him altogether. He thinks that he cannot get closer to the flowers, hiding from their attacks behind a stone. Just because this flower is a boss shouldn't mean it has an infinite supply of charges, right? It's all a waste of potatoes. And indeed the flower's shells run out, and Kiraboshi Haruki cuts it down. He thinks that the boss had about a hundred potatoes. He wonders if this flower is too weak. Kiraboshi Haruki approaches the remaining colors and thinks about what he will receive as a reward for winning. And then his eyes widen in shock. Later he comes to the sales girl and asks if she has it here. She, without looking up from collecting the box and without turning to Haruki Kiraboshi, speaks closed. After these words, he turns around and says sorry, adding that then he will go to Sapporo. The girl immediately shouts loudly to him, stop, don't. Kiraboshi Haruki tells her that then she must serve the customer. Kiraboshi Haruki lays out his trophies. The girl tells him that he killed a bunch of monsters again. He answers with a smile that it's only a hundred. The girl asks Kiraboshi Haruka that he needs to kill a hundred to let off steam. The girl asks Kiraboshi Haruka what he managed to get. Does he get tired at all or not? Kiraboshi Haruki replies that he is very tired. The girl tells him that he is crazy. Kiraboshi Haruki says yes, yes. And what is there? What is there for the money? The girl says that she will look now. She says that the boss claw is just a big claw. It can be used to make a sword, but Haruki Kiraboshi will not be able to use it. And this is magic iron. When processed, it is usually mixed with some material. As a result, they get a very durable material that can be used in many places. For example, make it Tsuba. It was also used in Haruka's Kiraboshi dagger. He then asks that this is apparently a very valuable metal. The girl tells him that with about a kilogram, he can make about 10 strong shields. Kiraboshi Haruki answers clearly. The girl says, what is this? Referring to Kiraboshi Haruka's last trophy. She takes one of them in her hands and says stones. Kiraboshi Haruki replies yeah, and asks him. The girl throws the stone back into the pile and says that's all. Kiraboshi Haruki screams that no, it can't be. They drop from the boss. The girl takes one of them in her hands and says let's see. These stones are quite hard and look like potatoes. She says that the price of these stones is zero yuan. She won't buy them. The girl tells Haruki Kiraboshi that if he decided to do a detailed assessment, they might turn out to be magical. 
but to her they are just stones. Then the girl hands Kariboshi Haruka a pot and says that it is a super rare magic pot. More precisely, he was like that. Kariboshi Haruki asked. The girl says that he put several stones in a pot to transport them, right? Kariboshi Haruki tells her yes. The girl says that this pot increases the amount of everything that is put in it. The amount of course varies depending on the item, its mass and volume. The girl thinks that they will receive hundreds of kilograms of these stones. If Kariboshi Haruki put a gold bar inside, no matter how many times he pulled them out, they would appear there again and again, and the pot would literally become a source of gold. Kariboshi Haruki repeats her words in shock, he would. But now this pot is just a garbage generator. Haruki Kariboshi clutches his head in horror and loudly screams no. Karen sits at the computer and wraps her arms around herself, thinking that it's interesting that Kariboshi Haruki is now in the dungeon. Stones fall to the floor. Kariboshi Haruki sits and sadly throws stones. Yuyujuki Akain tries to remove the stones and shouts to Kariboshi Haruki that she understands that he is depressed, but he must pull himself together. He wants to fill the entire store with his garbage. Kariboshi Haruki asks Yuyujuka Akain how much this thing would have been worth if he had not ruined it. She replies that this pot is a very rare thing, so its value is about a trillion. Kariboshi Haruki thinks trillion in shock. He is crushed. Yuyujuki Akain tells him not to worry so much. She is sure that she will find another one just like her. By the way, she has a sale tomorrow, he can come and choose something. Later, Kariboshi Haruki sits at the computer and watches it. His post today received 4 views and 1 like. Kariboshi Haruki screams that he screwed up so badly, why should he like it here? What the hell is going on? Karen comes up to him and says good morning with a smile. He wearily answers her kindly. She asks Haruka Kariboshi if they will go to the dungeon or if he wants to go to the lower floors. Kariboshi Haruki tells her no. First they will go to the gun store. Yuujuki Akane told him that she was having a sale today. They enter the store. Akain Yuujuki is sitting there on the counter, and Kidora-san is sitting at her feet. Then Yuujuki Akain notices that they have come to the store. She asks Kidora-san for forgiveness, saying that clients have arrived. He tells the girl okay, she can call him if she needs help. Yuujuki Akain walks past Karen and Kariboshi Haruka and waves to the old man, shouting thank you. Then the girl notices Karen. Yuujuki Akain asks her why she is alone and where is this one. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that he is right in front of her, and then she pays attention to him and with a smile asks him why he is so secretive. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that she noticed him before. Completely relaxed, Yuujuki Akane shouts to them that they should come in and hurry up to leave all their money to her. And he immediately corrects himself, saying that he wishes everyone successful shopping. She places the goods on the table in front of Haruki and Karen's Kariboshi. Karen puts on gloves and says that she hopes the weapon won't slip out of her hands. Kariboshi Haruki asks the seller what size the shoes are. The girl tells him that, of course, the shoes are his size. She measured his footprints in front of the store. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that she is amazing. Then they have a dagger and a staff. Kariboshi Haruki takes the weapon by the hilt and says that he can lift it. He won't be able to use it. Yuujuki Akane replies that the dagger is not from the dungeon. Kariboshi Haruki asks that the dagger is powerful after all. The girl tells him that she has no idea. Even with all her knowledge, she does not know this. Kariboshi Haruki says that that is, Yuujuki Akane was ordered to sell him. She replies that they keep this store as a warehouse. Karen comes out of the fitting room and talks about how it fits so well. Kariboshi Haruki asks Karen if she can lift the staff. The girl asks him that if she can lift the staff, they will buy it. Kariboshi Haruki replies that it depends on how much it sells for. Karen picks up the staff and says it's so cool. Kariboshi Haruki looks at Karen in shock and thinks that she has mastered a high-level weapon so quickly. He's so jealous of her. He asks Yuujuka Akane how much the staff costs. She replies that it is worth 1 million. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen to put the staff where she got it. The seller yells at them to wait a second. Kariboshi Haruki told her that he would buy it if Karen could use it. Kariboshi Haruki asks her what the starting price is. Yuujuki Akane remains silent in response. Kariboshi Haruki says okay then they will go to Sapporo. Yuujuki Akane shouts okay, she will say, just don't let them leave. Kariboshi Haruki says that he will buy the staff for 20,000. The girl shouts that the staff was received on the 20th floor of Chikaho. It costs at least 50. They start haggling and come to a price of 35,000. Karen asks the girl for forgiveness for the fact that they dropped so much. The girl cries, saying that she is ruined. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the dagger and says that it is not sharp and why is it needed. The girl replies that it is a cursed dagger. Kariboshi Haruki asks about that and what to do with it. It's not spicy at all. 
Yuyuki Akane tells him that he says everything like that. But it's a magic dagger. The more monsters he kills, the sharper he will become. Kiraboshi Haruki shouts that this is a divine weapon. Why hasn't anyone bought it yet? The girl replies that because no one needs him. Kiraboshi Haruki asks why. The girl replies that it is a dagger. It is difficult to deal with monsters with a dagger, so there are few crazy adventurers who use daggers. She asks Kiraboshi Haruka whether he takes the dagger or not. He asks in response, what's the catch? The girl says that there is no catch. Let him buy a dagger. Kiraboshi Haruki asks how much it costs. The girl says a million. Kiraboshi Haruki leaves, and she shouts after him that she was joking. She will give the dagger almost for nothing. Just let him not leave. Kiraboshi Haruki asks the girl if he can leave her an order. She says she has a standard system for delivering goods and equipment. And what does Kiraboshi Haruka need? He replies that he needs a carving knife and medicine for the adventurers. What quality knife does he need? Kiraboshi Haruki tells her to let her choose herself. Yuyuki Akane tells Kiraboshi Haruki that if he needs anything again, he should just let her know. But seeing his reaction he says it more friendly. Kiraboshi Haruki looks at his dagger and Karen asks him about defeating the boss yesterday. He realizes that she apparently read his blog. She asks Karen about being a burden to him. He tells her that under no circumstances. He just walked and walked forward and came across it. Karen says that she really wants to become stronger as soon as possible. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks unnecessary, inconspicuous, uncommunicative, it's as if he doesn't exist. She knows what it's like, so he wants to become stronger. So Kiraboshi Haruki tells Karen that they will defeat everyone today. She is very happy about his words. They easily deal with raccoons. Kiraboshi Haruki watches Karen's attack and thinks it's so cool. Very good. While he fought and moved forward, Karen covered him with her magic. Hunting alone is certainly good, but fighting alongside someone shoulder to shoulder is much more interesting. Later, Karen tells Haruki Kiraboshi that it's great that he gives his all to the battle and all, but please let him count his strength. Karen tells Haruki Kiraboshi that he fell in the middle of the fight and she didn't know what happened to him. Kiraboshi Haruki tells Karen that she has become much stronger, however. Karen says that this staff is much better at conducting magic than the previous one. Karen asks Kiraboshi Haruki to stay on topic and think about her actions. He tells her okay, next time he will be more careful. Here again a strange sound is heard. Karen calls Kiraboshi Haruki. After a short time the tremors stop. Kiraboshi Haruki says that it looks like it was a slight push. Karen says they probably noticed it on the surface too. Kiraboshi Haruki says they should get back to hunting. The saleswoman asks how much they brought this time. Only 352 and all without damage. Karen talks about how there's so much that fits into the magic bag. Kiraboshi Haruki tells the girl that they will do this for another 3 or 4 days. They might even be able to recoup the money they spent on equipment. The girl asks them if they are taking revenge on her for something or what. Kiraboshi Haruki asks the girl if she has recently felt an earthquake. She asks if it happened. Kiraboshi Haruki and Karen are surprised. Everything happened so suddenly. And nothing foreshadowed trouble. On that day, an invasion of monsters began throughout Japan. Everything is quiet and calm in Haruka Kiraboshi's house. The clock is ticking steadily. Kiraboshi Haruki is sleeping. But then he suddenly wakes up from some sound and immediately jumps up on the bed. He quickly puts on his gear and takes his weapon. Kiraboshi Haruki walks up to the stairs and looks down. He thinks, oh shit, he has a bad feeling. Later, Kiraboshi Haruki stands at the phone and receives a message that he is calling the local police department. Kiraboshi Haruki says that recently a dungeon entrance appeared in his garage, and now there is a strange noise coming from there. He asks the police to come please. The employee tells him that they understand everything. They send rapid response forces at him and ask Kiraboshi Haruki to introduce himself. He introduces himself and says that he is an adventurer. The employee tells him that she understood everything. When the squad arrives, it should act according to their instructions. Kiraboshi Haruki says okay and then dials another number. He asks to call a girl who recently stayed at the hotel. Karen answers the phone sleepily and immediately screams, recognizing the voice of Kiraboshi Haruka. He tells Karen that there is a risk of invasion. He asks her to get up, get ready and come to him as soon as possible. Karen replies that she understands. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks that Karen was sleeping and he stunned her with such news. Kiraboshi Haruki looks at the tablet and thinks about what he knew. The number of site visits has increased. Here Yuujuki Akane goes to Kiraboshi Haruki, who asks him what he is doing here so early. He replies that she does the same and opens a store. Yuujuki Akane replies that he doesn't know that she's a legendary manager. That's why she takes deliveries early in the morning, and she's sure that the medications arrived today. 
Karaboshi Haruki says that he will buy everything there is. She replies that it's cool, but something happened. Karaboshi Haruki says that it looks like an invasion is coming. Yujuki Akane says she's leaving. Karaboshi Haruki tries to detain her, but she screams that she doesn't need problems. Karaboshi Haruki tells her that she is also an adventurer. Even if she runs away, she can still be called upon for help. Yuyujuki Akane replies that her ID is no longer valid, so she thinks no one will notice if she's gone. She says that she didn't talk about being an adventurer and how he found out. Karaboshi Haruki replies that he guessed from his gait and movements, and for an ordinary seller she understands everything too well. Karaboshi Haruki tells her okay, let her sell him some medicine. Later, Karen comes to their store and says that she found it. She asks Karaboshi Haruka that the monster invasion has already begun. He tells her that everything is calm for now. Karaboshi Haruki says that monsters are now appearing everywhere, but at different times. Karaboshi Haruki calls Karen and asks her to explain what's going on when the rapid reaction forces arrive, and he will go down into the dungeon. Karaboshi Haruki smiles and says that he will go hunt the boss. Karen yells at him that it's too dangerous. Yuyujuki Akane shouts to him that Karen is right, and does Karaboshi Haruki know how many monsters there are? He's completely lost his mind. Karaboshi Haruki replies that the only way to stop the invasion is by killing all the monsters. But perhaps there is another option. This is to kill the boss who is leading the invasion. He goes on reconnaissance. If there is an opportunity to kill him, then Karaboshi Haruki will fight him. So instead of just trying to hold off the invasion and protect the city, Karen yells at him that she will come with him then. Karaboshi Haruki tells Karen no, she will stay here. She asks but why? Karaboshi Haruki tells Karen that she will be in the way. She's shocked. Karaboshi Haruki tries to explain everything to her and takes off his mask. He says that only he can get past the monsters without being noticed. That's why Karen should stay here. Karen replies that she understands. Just let Karaboshi Haruki not dare to do anything reckless like last time. Karaboshi Haruki tells her it's agreed and leaves. Later, Yujuki Akane says that Karaboshi Haruki is an idiot. Basitsagu-san shouts that they went there and need to be detained. He commands other people in battle against monsters. Masatsugu-san says that the level of this defense cannot be lower, but there are many of them, so they can cope. Masatsugu-san saves the girls from the monsters and shouts to them that it is dangerous here, and they need to leave. Then Masatsugu-san's phone rings. He gets a call from Bacon, who asks him if everything is okay. He replies that yes, he is now in Hokkaido. He asks how Bacon is doing. He replies that they are coping somehow, but monsters are starting to emerge from the middle levels. They wonder where the other rangers are. Most of those he called are already here. Only Shigur is on the expedition. Bacon tells Masatsugu-san that he will send 10 strong guys to him. The rapid reaction forces are almost there and we must wait for their arrival. Karaboshi Haruki opens the phone and begins to read the news portal about the invasion. They still have a lot to do. There is real panic in the comments and more than 500 messages. Masatsugu-san tightens his grip on his sword and says that it's time to save Japan. At this time, Kuraboshi Haruki is running through the dungeon. He thinks that he is scared. It's like he's on a night expedition. He opens his panel and, having examined it, says that he has two more skill points. One for a rainy day, and the second. He sees monsters ahead, Tanuki, Onion and Centipede. But great, they didn't seem to notice him. And then he notices the silver wolves. They have an excellent sense of smell. Karaboshi Haruki begins throwing rocks at the monsters. He shouts that everything will work out great for him. After all, his best weapon is a stone potato. Karaboshi Haruki thinks about how he can focus on the silver wolves. He throws stones at them and runs further, thinking about that the detachment could hold everyone else except the silver wolves. Then Karaboshi Haruki falls to the ground. He says that something is not good for him. He notices the boss. This is a huge silver wolf, although no. This is a werewolf. This is a rare type of silver wolf, a mid-level monster. Karaboshi Haruki runs away, thinking that they cannot cope with him. But the werewolf catches up with him and attacks. Haruki's Karaboshi falls to the ground as the werewolf stands over him. Karaboshi Haruki looks at the monster and thinks that this is rubbish. And soldiers and people howl with monsters and build barricades. Karen also fights monsters. She thinks that about five minutes have passed since the beginning of the invasion, and only the weakest of the monsters remained. There are not so many of them, and reinforcements also came to them. Looks like this invasion won't be so crazy. Karen wonders if it's Haruki's Karaboshi. Someone is calling her. This is Kidora-san. Karen yells at him that he better get out of here. It's too dangerous here. 
he tells Karen that she is too worried about him. Karen replies that she is an adventurer. Her duty is to protect people from monsters. Karen thinks about how she spent so much time in the dungeon. Now she is no longer the girl who couldn't do anything. But then several people are threatened by a monster. Karen thinks that the distance allows her to use magic. But then she remembers that she is not in a dungeon. But then Yuyuki Akane deals with the monsters. She shouts that the barricades need to be restored and quickly. Karen later wears bags and watches Yuyuki Akane interact with people with a smile. Then Karen approaches one of the soldiers and tells him that he is wounded. She will help him. Yuyuki Akane yells at Karen not to touch the wounds with her bare hands. She asks Karen that she doesn't want to get an infection in the wound. Karen tells Yuyuki Akane that if she had defended the barricade instead of standing on the sidelines, no one would have gotten hurt. Yuyuki Akane tells Karen that he doesn't understand what she's talking about. Karen yells at her not to play dumb. The way Yuyuki Akane fights, everyone will understand that she is strong, so why does she behave this way? Yuyuki Akane tells Karen that if she is weak, then others have nothing to do with it. If she has time for such conversations, then it is better to spend it usefully. Karen asks Akane Yuyuki why she doesn't fight with the others. Yuyuki Akane replies that she is simply protecting her store. At times like these, she just hates that her store is so close to the dungeon. Then someone tells Yuyuki Akane that Karen is right. If it bothers her so much, she better be stronger for the next invasion. The soldiers shout that the monsters must not be allowed to break through the barricade. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the werewolf and thinks about what he is doing. He looks at his weapon and thinks about what if he adds another skill point. But no, he doesn't want to do it again. If Kariboshi Haruki escapes, then... If this monster gets out, then someone might die. And this will be due to the fact that Haruki's Kariboshi will be shot down. Because he didn't take the fight. Someone could die because of it. Kariboshi Haruki gets up and thinks about why he won't run away. Then he notices that the werewolf is smiling, just like a human. Kariboshi Haruki enters the fight and thinks that the werewolf is monstrously strong. But he needs to be very careful. He needs to concentrate. Kariboshi Haruki fights a werewolf. He thinks about that little by little he begins to see the movements of his opponent. It's center of gravity. But Kariboshi Haruki feels weak. His body is numb. But it's even more interesting for him to fight. Kariboshi Haruki laughs, telling the werewolf he's good. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that little by little his attacks are starting to reach their target. But the werewolf counterattacks him. Kariboshi Haruki falls to the ground and thinks that this attack was too fast. Kariboshi Haruki coughs and thinks that he will not survive another blow. Kariboshi Haruki coughs and puts on his mask, revealing his skill bar. The werewolf rushes at him, growling, raising his paw to strike. He knocks the mask off Kariboshi Haruka's face with a blow of his paw. And Kariboshi Haruki contracts him, striking the monster's chest with daggers. The werewolf falls to the ground exhausted, and Haruki's Kariboshi falls next to him. Kariboshi Haruki looks wearily at the body of the monster, from which his weapon sticks out. He says it was fun, but this is the limit of his strength. The werewolf looks at him, grins and closes his eyes. Kariboshi Haruki says that he fell and tiredly lowers his head to the ground. Here, after a while, Haruki Kariboshi comes to his senses. He thinks about how it feels so heavy on his stomach. This is Karen. She calls Kariboshi Haruki. She says with tears in her eyes that she searched him everywhere. She thought Haruki's Kariboshi was eaten. He asks her for forgiveness and asks about what is happening outside. Karen wipes her mouth and says with a smile that it's all over. Everybody is alive. Soldiers remove the bodies of monsters. Oida is in touch. The invasion is over. They're safe. Akita is here. They have everything too. According to the wiki articles, killing the boss ends the invasion. You just need to be careful. The bosses are very dangerous. Fortunately, there are few of them. But then you will have to drag yourself straight through the entire parade of monsters to find the boss. Masatsugu-san says that everything is over in Sapporo, there are no dead. He asks if anyone knows about the situation in Shinjuku. He can't contact Bacon. He is told to read the messages above. Shinjuku is destroyed. One of the soldiers throws the corpse of the killer rabbit into a pile with the rest of the monsters. They say that it seems like it was the last one. The soldiers do not understand why everything ended so suddenly. According to information online, the invasion ends if you defeat the boss. The soldiers don't understand who did it. Then Kariboshi Haruki and Karen leave the dungeon, but no one sees him. Everyone only sees Karen. The soldiers tell Karen that as soon as she entered the dungeon, 
The invasion ended immediately. They ask her about what, really? Karen shouts to them yes, it was Kariboshi Haruki who defeated the boss. He imagines how everyone rejoices at him and that he feels the glory. The soldiers don't understand who Karen is talking about, and they answer that it's better not to be modest. Kariboshi Haruki watches as the soldiers look at Karen and completely ignore him. He thinks that he didn't even level up his stealth. He doesn't understand why everyone around him doesn't notice him. He doesn't understand why they all continue to ignore him. He has become persona non grata and doesn't know it. But then Kariboshi Haruki opens his panel and thinks that this cannot be. He didn't even level up his stealth. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that these skills of his are being upgraded on their own. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about how sad he is. He is very sad and should probably go home. Karen, surrounded by soldiers, calls for help. Kariboshi Haruki puts on a mask and throws the body of a werewolf at the feet of the soldiers. Kariboshi Haruki greets everyone and introduces himself. He says that this werewolf was the boss of the invasion. Then all the soldiers in shock shout to Kariboshi Haruki that he has been standing there for a long time. Yuyujuki Akane approaches the monster's body. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that she is just in time and let her deal with the monster's body. And then he would like to make a couple of orders. Yuyujuki Akane tells him that he will do large orders. He has money, he has a lot of it. Some people don't have money, what a pity it's not there and there are no orders. Kariboshi Haruki says okay, that means war. He runs and shouts to Karen that he will need her help. One hour later, Kariboshi Haruki and Karen bring a mountain of monster bodies to Yuyujuki Akane. Yuyujuki Akane says that this must be some kind of joke. Why the hell are there so many monsters? Yuyujuki Akane asks Kariboshi Haruki to stop. She will do anything. He has an adventurer coupon. With this coupon, Kariboshi Haruki receives 5% more money from the sale of materials. Yuyujuki Akane clutches his head in horror. Kariboshi Haruki later learned that the invasion at Shinjuku Station had failed to stop that night. And now the surrounding area of Shinjuku is occupied by monsters. Despite the presence of great adventurers, all this was the result of a series of failures. Firstly, the whole point is the absence of Japan's main military power, Masatsugu. And secondly, the simultaneous appearance of monsters in 63 locations. And besides, all the monsters were of an average level. And also the sudden disappearance of Masatsugu's replacement, Bacon. As a result, all the other adventurers also retreated to save their lives. In an instant, news of the fall of Shinjuku spread throughout Japan, and the country was gripped by fear and despair. The next day, Kuroboshi Haruki is sitting and reading the news on his tablet when Karen comes up to him and asks him that there is again bad news about Shinjuku. I wonder what will happen to Japan now. Kariboshi Haruki replies that it seems to him that Masatsunu-san wrote in a blog about the operation to liberate Shinjuku. He is a top ranker, and he must cope with this. Although Kariboshi Haruka feels uneasy at the thought that it's better not to meddle in Shinjuzu Canal. With their level they won't be able to help. Karen answers him exactly. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that this is why they must become stronger. They practice later. Kariboshi Haruki smiles and tells Karen that defeating the potato monsters is so easy. Karen lies on the ground and asks if this is so. Karen asks Kariboshi Haruki not to say anything. He is so cruel. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that she is rude. She could defeat them if she watched where they were aiming. It's all about speed. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen that he understands that this is too difficult for her. Karen screams that she will do it. Kariboshi Haruki asks her to try again. Karen attacks the flower and says that she can do anything if she tries. She smiles and asks about Haruki's Kariboshi attack. He shouts to her in horror what she has done. She doesn't understand what's wrong with him. Kariboshi Haruki shouts that Karen killed the plant before it was shot at. They won't get potatoes that way. Kariboshi Haruki picks up the bush and talks about how Karen could have done this. She tells him that he can always come here and collect more. Kariboshi Haruki shouts to Karen that the ghost of the potato will appear in her nightmares. Karen shouts to Kariboshi Haruki that he can just plant his garden with potatoes and calm down from there. That same night, Kariboshi Haruki collects potato flowers in the cave. He plants them in glass boxes with soil and brings them home. He says that the transplant operation was successful. Kariboshi Haruki looks at his boxes and says that he never thought about mass production of potatoes. Karen is so smart. The soil for seedlings is already ready. Now you just need to wait a little. The next day, Kariboshi Haruki says good morning to his potato, but notices that it is all wilted. He approaches the boxes and says that this can't be true, really. 
it seems they still cannot live outside the dungeon. One of the flowers turns out to be alive. Teraboshi Haruki screams about how to help him. The flower, trembling, points its leaf at the jug. Teraboshi Haruki takes the jug and brings it to the flower, asking about his need for this jug. The flower, with trembling petals, takes out a stone from there and places it in the ground near itself. Immediately the flower is restored. Teraboshi Haruki shouts joyfully that that the flower is already better. It seems to him that even his aura has changed. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks that this stone potato fell from the boss, that is, it came straight from the dungeon. Kiraboshi Haruki asks the flower that maybe it needs nutritional elements from the underground. The flower nods in response. Kiraboshi Haruki, shocked, shouts to the flower that he understands what he is talking about. The flower nods again. Kiraboshi Haruki takes the flower pot in his hands and enthusiastically says that the day has really come when he can talk to plants. He transplanted the flower into a pot. Kiraboshi Haruki asks the flower if it has a name. The flower turns its head negatively. Kiraboshi Haruki says this is so unusual. He decides to come up with a name for the flower. Kiraboshi Haruki suggests the name potato plant for him. But the flower does not like this name. Kiraboshi Haruki proposes to lace, but gets hit in the face. Pring doesn't like it either, just like potatoes K-A-R-T-O, like potatoes. Kiraboshi Haruki, all beat up, asks the flower what about Rei's name. The flower likes this name. Kiraboshi Haruki says that Rei was the goddess of fertility in Greek mythology. This is all that Kiraboshi Haruki can offer the flower, but it seems to like the name. Kiraboshi Haruki apologizes to Rei for putting her here, but he did it for a reason. He wanted to grow potatoes. But Rei doesn't let him finish, she shoots a potato into his hand, but the fruit is completely stunted and dry. Kiraboshi Haruki doesn't understand why the potatoes are so dry. He asks Rei that she can no longer produce potatoes. She turns her head negatively. Kiraboshi Haruki asks if this is because of him. He falls on his knees in front of Rei in apology. Later, Kiraboshi Haruki and Karen are walking in the dungeons and a girl calls out to him. She asks if they can take a break. They have been hunting for more than two hours. Kiraboshi Haruki tells her no, he is not tired. Karen sternly yells that they will take a break. Kiraboshi Haruki agrees. He moves away from Karen, and she looks at his back and thinks that lately Kiraboshi Haruki has been in the clouds and constantly thinking about something. Karen thinks about how she hopes that Haruki Kiraboshi will remember to cover for her if they get into a fight with monsters. She looks at Kiraboshi Haruki and thinks that if something is eating him, can she help him? Kiraboshi Haruki takes the soil in his hand and thinks that he wonders if there are fertilizers for the plants from the underground. He hopes so. And if not, is it then possible to use fertilizers for ordinary plants? What if such fertilizer is not suitable for the flower and the plant dies? Or nothing will happen to him? Here the ground is dry as stone. That's right, there is no water in the dungeon. And he watered the soil before replanting Rei. Maybe that's why she ends up with dry potatoes. Karen watches Haruka Kiraboshi's actions and thinks that things are even worse than she thought. Later, Kiraboshi Haruki tells Karen that they will see each other tomorrow. They did a great job. Karen watches Haruki Kiraboshi leave and thinks that he scares her. Kiraboshi Haruki seemed like a strong person to her, but it seems she was wrong. He alone went against the invasion. Kiraboshi Haruki always fights for hours on end. But Karen thinks that the reason lies in the fact that Kiraboshi Haruka is missing something. And today Kiraboshi Haruki behaved strangely. Karen runs after Haruki's Kiraboshi to his house. She opens the door and apologizes for the intrusion, calling out to Kiraboshi Haruki. But then she hears him say to someone, Ri, why not? I have to put it in here. At least a little. Karen stands there in complete shock after this. She thinks about whether Kiraboshi Haruki really lives with a girl. She imagines the girl sitting and asking Kiraboshi Haruka if he will tell her about one of his adventures. First she wants to go on an adventure with him at night. Here Kiraboshi Haruki, who is standing over the flower, hears some strange sound. He leaves the room and shouts in shock, seeing Karen lying on the floor. Volunteers on a nameless campaign. There is an active discussion of the events that happened. Someone writes, Masatsugu-san went there light. There is no news yet, but Masatsugu-san should be in touch soon. People are actively writing in the comments, discussing what is happening and building various theories. Meanwhile, Karen yells at Kiraboshi Haruka about what a monster is doing at his house. In response, he asks Karen not to worry, saying that this little flower's name is Ri. He brought it from the dungeon. Karen screams in shock and brought it to him. She shouts to Kiraboshi Haruka what was he thinking. He brought home a monster. He replies that Ri is indeed a monster, but she is good. Karen shouts that Ri is a monster after all. Kiraboshi Haruki replies that monsters also need to survive somehow. 
they could become friends. Karen tries to argue with him, and Karaboshi Haruki interrupts her and says that she can look at the adventurers of the first 13 floors in Chikaho. He asks Karen what makes those adventurers different from monsters. Karen remembers those he's talking about. Karaboshi Haruki continues by saying that the adventurers of the first 13 floors in Chikaho deliberately provoke and smoke monsters out of their norms in order to kill them. What he's trying to say is that it's not about whether they're friends or enemies, it's about survival. Karaboshi Haruki says that there won't be any problems with Reya, they are friends after all. Karen screams that Re just hit him. Karaboshi Haruki says that hitting means loving. At this time, Re shoots a potato at him. Karen, seeing this, is very indignant. She yells at Karaboshi Haruka that they need to uproot Reya. Karaboshi Haruki takes the flower and asks Karen to wait. He tries to calm the girl down and protect his flower from her. Later, Kuraboshi Haruki walks and pushes a cart, thinking that he is glad that he managed to convince Karen yesterday. But what should he do next with Ri? He comes to Katori-san and tells him that he brought him more meat. Katori-san tells Kuraboshi Haruki that he brought the same monster meat. It turned out to be quite good, and he feels embarrassed again in front of Haruki's Kuraboshi. In this case, he asks him to also accept something as a gift. He gives the plants to Karaboshi Haruka. He looks at them in shock and asks Katori-san how many years he has been growing them. He replies that these are last year's seedlings. Karaboshi Haruki smiles and says that these plants are beautiful. He tells Katori-san that he thought it took them over five years to grow to this size. Katori-san replies that yes, but if you use monster meat compost, everything grows much faster. Karaboshi Haruki asks Katori-san if he can share some of this compost with him. He tells him of course with a smile. Katori-san tells Kariboshi Haruki that by the way, he found this among the meat. He doesn't know what it is, so he gives it to Kariboshi Haruka. He looks in shock at the object handed to him and says this. Later, Kariboshi Haruki returns to Reya and says that here he is. He asks her why she is still sulking at him. They figured it all out yesterday, but Ri is still offended by him. Kariboshi Haruki places a stone in the ground in a pot, and the flower immediately perks up. Kariboshi Haruki shouts that he knew that Ri would like this land. Kariboshi Haruki says that the meat of the monsters from the dungeon contains useful substances that are needed for the growth of the flower. Kariboshi Haruki asks Ri if she wants the pebble he got. This is a magic stone, a very rare stone that can fall out of a monster's body. Ri extends her petals to the stone. Kariboshi Haruki gives her the stone and asks her if she forgot anything. He asks her where is the thank you in return. Reya bends the bud and tries to hit Haruki's Kariboshi with it. He asks her not to fight, saying that he brought her a tasty treat, but she tries to fight. Later, Kuraboshi Haruki and Karen fight again in the dungeon. Kuraboshi Haruki thinks that Karen has become much stronger, and in pure firepower, she surpassed Haruki's Kuraboshi. But thanks to the accelerated growth skill, he levels up much faster than Karen. Therefore, they remain on an equal footing with her. Kariboshi Haruki and Karen come to the store and say that they are selling 350 silver wolf carcasses and hope that Yuyujuki Akane will buy them. She replies that it's good, now she will calculate everything. She begins to count the carcasses of wolves. After some time, Yuyujuki Akane tells Kariboshi Haruki that the total price for the wolf carcasses is 187,500 yen. And yes, Haruki's Kariboshi carving knife arrived. He says with a smile how quickly, Yuujuki Akane says it's express delivery. She asks him if he should sharpen his knife. Kariboshi Haruki answers yes in shock. Akane gets to work. After a while, she places a knife on the table in front of Kariboshi Haruki and asks for forgiveness for the wait. Kariboshi Haruki asks how much he owes, but the girl is silent. Kariboshi Haruki calls Akane. She asks what? Kariboshi Haruki asks Akane what's wrong with her today and where is her daily energy. Akane replies that she can't be like this all the time. Kariboshi Haruki says that this is understandable, but she even became more polite. Akane crosses her arms and tells Haruki Kariboshi that she doesn't know what he's talking about. But he immediately adds that Kariboshi Haruki is right. If they really care about her, they might listen to her. Kariboshi Haruki tells her yes. Akane says that the head of their Sapporo branch has gone missing. It all started with a drop in store income. At first she thought that the head was hiding from his angry superiors. But then she decided to check the history of her electronic card. And as it turned out, the head of their branch went to Chikaho. Kariboshi Haruki asks Akane how long it has been since the head disappeared. Akane replies about five days. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about it. Akane says that only the record of the descent into Chikaho, and the number of days since the disappearance, and where the head approximately descended into the dungeon is also unknown. 
Kariboshi Haruki asks Karen that she will go in search of her head. Karen says exactly, Akane san is incredibly strong. Akane says she needs to keep an eye on the store. In addition, the branch manager or management will not forgive her for shirking work due to the absence of a colleague. Kariboshi Haruki asks Akane why she doesn't take the day off. She asks if she has days off. Kariboshi Haruki and Karen shout in shock that Akane doesn't have days off. She tells them that in this place, work is no different from a day off. Well that's a fact. Here Akane asks Haruka Kariboshi that if she creates a quest, he will take it on. Kariboshi Haruki thinks in shock that this is his first quest. He says out loud that his decision depends on the details. Akane says that in this case, she will create the quest find the branch head. Chikaho place within the first eight floors. Kariboshi Haruki repeats after her the words of eight floors. He asks Akane why the head went there. Akane replies that the head accepted a quest from the equipment factory to obtain materials from the Silver Wolf. Well, in order to meet the deadline, she went to the dungeon herself. In Chikaho, Silver Wolves appear from the 6th to 8th floor. The chapter must be out there somewhere now. Kariboshi Haruki says yes, that's probably true. He asks Akane what the deadline is. Searching until they find is pointless. There may not even be a bone left of the head. Kariboshi Haruki says that he sees no point in starting the search. Also, is it suitable for this? Akane says that of course he fits. She gives him a month, and she thinks that they should take Karen's magic bag and collect the necessary supplies for this period. Kariboshi Haruki begins to reason out loud that if they take it, and then says that no, they still won't take it. Akane sadly asks why he said that then and why he kept up this conversation at all. Kariboshi Haruki tells her, I'm sorry. He has some circumstances and he cannot leave his home. He means Karen and Ri. Akane slams the crayfish on the table and says damn, adventurers only think about themselves. She shouts to Kariboshi Haruki, saving people, protecting Japan, all you can do is talk and boast. And when there is real trouble, the adventurers sincerely don't care about anyone. Kariboshi Haruki replies that if the person in trouble were in front of him, then that would be one thing. And now he is far from that place, so why blame him for not going? Kariboshi Haruki shouts to Akane that if she wants to help, then she should ask the adventurers from Sapporo. Here Kariboshi Haruki calls Karen and touches him on the shoulder several times. She asks Kariboshi Haruka that he can't leave the house because of that little girl. Karen asks Kariboshi Haruka what if this is the case, then maybe they should take it with them. She can move around while sitting in a potty. Kariboshi Haruki replies that Reya can, of course, but that's okay. Karen asks him what he means. Kariboshi Haruki says that Reya is a monster. Karen responds to Haruki's Kariboshi that she has no reason to trust Ri. But if Haruki Kariboshi said that Reya is good, then she believes it. She tells Haruki Kariboshi that they are a party. Kariboshi Haruki looks at her in surprise. Karen says that it is true that the branch manager is far from here, but he must watch how Akane san suffers. Karen looks at Akane with sadness in her eyes, and Haruki Kariboshi looks at her. He finally tells Akane that okay, they'll take her quest. Akane smiles happily, as does Karen. Kariboshi Haruki says that they will accept her quest on the condition that on top of the quest reward, she will cover the costs of her search. Akane answers him naturally. He is guaranteed a reward, 300,000 yen. For completing the task another 200,000 yen. If Kariboshi Haruki and Karen complete it in one day, then she will pay another 500,000 yen. She asks Haruka Kariboshi if it is seductive. The same one in response asks her if her proposal is serious. Akane continues, saying that in addition, she will buy all the items collected during the quest at 5% more. And on top of that, a simple assessment of the item and restoration of equipment is free. Akane also bears the cost of accommodation, food and treatment. She asks them if they agree. Kariboshi Haruki shouts that this is an excellent proposal. Kariboshi Haruki and Karen agree to the quest. Later, Kariboshi Haruki and Karen leave the store. Karen follows Haruki's Kariboshi and calls out to him. And when he turns around, she tells him thank you very much for agreeing to the quest. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen that she doesn't need to thank him. Karen tells him thanks anyway. Kariboshi Haruki replies that he was always told that he was talented and did the right thing. But now he will do his best while thinking about others as well. He realized that now he wants to help other people. Karen calls Kariboshi Haruki, and he continues, saying that what led him to such an idea was Karen's words. And he immediately says that they should end the discussion here. It's time for them to get ready for the trip. They leave tomorrow. Karen says yes with a smile. Akane at this time thinks that she was able to send these idiots to search for a person. It was great. While some are afraid of contract failure, others are making money. 
What fools, real idiots. Akane laughs, and she says that it is thanks to such losers that talented people like her can truly unleash their potential. In a word, Akane girl is chaos. They only live for Akane to be on top. Although she lost her market and her world, her world suffered a serious loss. But they will never break her. Akane screams that she is too tenacious and purposeful. She will get out of any ass and nothing will stop her. Akane screams at the useless people and laughs. Kariboshi Haruki takes out a flower and tells Ri that it is time for them to get ready. She doesn't understand what he means. Kariboshi Haruki tells Rea that it's time for them to gather in Chikaho, far from here. Karen stands by the road and waits for Kariboshi Haruka. He comes to her by car. Karen sits down and stares sternly at the back seat where Ri's box sits. Karen tells Kariboshi Haruki that in Chikaho, the first seven floors are infested with silver wolves. She asks that they will cope with them. These wolves don't seem to be very strong. Kariboshi Haruki replies that they should handle it. But already from the sixth floor unpleasant surprises will begin. Karen doesn't understand what he's talking about. Kariboshi Haruki answers her traps. Pits with traps, they are not lethal, they will not cause unnecessary trouble. Karen tells Kariboshi Haruka that the monsters there are no different from theirs, but the difficulty of the dungeon itself is much higher. Here she found something like a manual for the game. Kariboshi Haruki says that dungeons happen a lot in games, but in real life they give birth to terrible monsters and somehow attract people to them. But Kariboshi Haruki does not believe that dungeons have no end. He can't wait to get into the dungeon as soon as possible. Karen asks about how long it will take them to get to the desired floor. Kariboshi Haruki replies that most likely about a month. Karen asks him if they will make it in time. Kariboshi Haruki replies that they must make it in time. Later, they arrive at the hotel and Karen asks Kariboshi Haruka what their plan of action is. He says they will come here first. Kariboshi Haruki and Karen enter a store called Black Dragon Cave. Kariboshi Haruki, looking at the goods enthusiastically, thinks that this is a specialty store. Due to the decline of science, occult things have already become mainstream. Science cannot explain what is happening in the world. She wasn't ready for this. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the basin with the eel. People were saved thanks to eels. The action lasts about a day. Kariboshi Haruki decides to take four just in case. Kariboshi Haruki goes to Karen and asks her if everything is okay. She stands by a basket with chicks, monster detectors. Karen takes one chick in her hands and says that it was he who made a peep. Kariboshi Haruki says that he has already brought Rea into the house and will also find some use for the chicken. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen that the price for the chick is too high, maybe they won't take it. Karen tells Kariboshi Haruki that he is right. She just liked them and they weren't that noisy. Later, Kariboshi Haruki and Karen fight in the dungeons. Kariboshi Haruki defeats a huge rabbit and thinks that the boss of the fourth floor was a giant killer rabbit. He was so clumsy, no comparison with the rabbits from their dungeon. Karen looks at Haruki's Kariboshi, clutching her staff in fear. Kariboshi Haruki asks Karen if she fought with the boss. She replies that no, so she can move on. Kariboshi Haruki answers her accepted. Kariboshi Haruki says that these rabbits are kind of weak, from the fourth floor. He tells Karen not to be afraid, because he is nearby. Karen asks him to be there. Karen begins to use magic against the rabbit. Kariboshi Haruki looks at her and thinks that the better Karen concentrates, the stronger her magic. And her attacks may be even stronger than his. He decides before going down to the sixth floor that he needs to take a look at what's going on with the skill points. Then Kariboshi Haruki looks at Rei's console and sees that she is female. So he didn't make a mistake with the name. Here Karen defeats the rabbit and shouts that she succeeded. Kariboshi Haruki tells her well done Karen and seeing her face asks about what happened to her. Karen replies that something is wrong. It was as if everything inside her had turned upside down. Kariboshi Haruki asks her what this means. Karen says that she seems to be able to see the dungeon more clearly, and she can see it better. Kariboshi Haruki says everything is fine. Karen can tell him everything that happens to her. Karen replies that most likely she just raised the level and now her senses have become heightened. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that's great. Karen says she'll go and get the rabbit. Kariboshi Haruki thinks there is no problem. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about how he spent one skill point in advance yesterday. But other than improved vision, I didn't feel any changes. Now he sees even the smallest cracks on the walls of the dungeon. Surely this will come in handy for him. Then they notice that grass is growing underground. Kariboshi Haruki suggests that Karen stop for a moment and assess the area. She answers him well. Kariboshi Haruki looks around and thinks that the longer he goes, the more colorful the dungeon becomes. Then Karen tells him that there is someone ahead. 
Kariboshi Haruki thinks that they were discovered, thereby depriving them of the right to make the first strike. And Silver Wolves approach them. Kariboshi Haruki and Karen defeat them with ease. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen that these wolves are exactly the same in strength as those in their dungeon. Karen asks Kariboshi Haruka if they will go to the seventh floor. Kariboshi Haruki says that he thinks they should also draw a map of the dungeon and look for the boss. If something goes wrong, they will come back. Karen tells him okay. Later, Kariboshi Haruki stands in front of the grass and asks Karen if she sees a trap here. She replies that yes, but barely. Kariboshi Haruki says that means then they can go. Karen calls Kariboshi Haruki. He has already entered the grass up to his waist and looks back at Karen. She shouts to him if everything is okay with him. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen that everything is fine. She tells him how he can have everything his way if he walked into a trap on purpose. Kariboshi Haruki replies that, well, yes, he wanted to understand how this trap worked. Karen asks Kariboshi Haruka what if there were chiseled peaks at the bottom. Kariboshi Haruki is silent at the beginning, and then shouts that if he had not fallen there, they would not have known that there was nothing there and it was also unclear where the boundaries of the trap were, and if he hadn't fallen here, they wouldn't have known it either. Karen thinks that it is better not to leave Haruki's Kariboshi unattended. Then they see a huge wolf ahead. Looks like it's the boss. This is a giant wolf. Karen asks Kariboshi Haruka what they will do. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that it's a pity that they don't have a tank in the party. They need to bypass five traps and only then attack. It will be quite difficult. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about what they can do. Spin like a spinning top and hit at the same time. Then maybe it's worth pumping up the speed. Here Kariboshi Haruki calls Karen. He tells her that he will reveal the secret. But he asks you to promise that they won't tell anyone. Karen tells Kariboshi Haruki I promise. Kariboshi Haruki tells her good and asks her to get Rea. Karen does not understand her request, but begins to fulfill it. Kariboshi Haruki opens his panel and thinks about investing 8 points at once. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that this is a valuable supply and he should try it. Then a stone flies at his head. Kariboshi Haruki apologizes to Rei for keeping her in the bag all the time. Kariboshi Haruki puts Rea in a pot and says that she can use it to replenish her ammunition. Kariboshi Haruki takes Rea on his shoulder and tells her that at his signal they will attack at the same time. Karen thinks that if something goes wrong, she will help them. Then Kariboshi Haruki rushes to attack the wolf and immediately shouts to Rei to attack. But Kariboshi Haruki does not have time to reach the wolf before Rei defeats him with her shots. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the flower and thinks that Rei is not even a year old. She is small and remote. Here Karen calls Kariboshi Haruki. She asks him why Rei was weak before, but now she has suddenly become strong. Kariboshi Haruki opens the console for Karen and asks her to look at it. He says it's his secret. Karen asks him that it is some kind of magical object. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that something like that. With this panel, he can improve his skills. Karen replies that if someone found out about her magical abilities, she would probably deal with this person. Kariboshi Haruki says that's why he hid it. But he trusts Karen. She is shocked that Haruki Kariboshi trusts her. Karen then points to an area in Haruki's Kariboshi panel and asks about it being her skill tree. Kariboshi Haruki tells her yes. If suddenly she wants to improve something, then. Karen interrupts him, shouting, magic. She asks to please invest all her points in magic. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen that she might get sick due to the sudden increase in skill. But she still asks him. Kariboshi Haruki answers her well and fulfills her request. Karen looks at her hands and says this is incredible. She shouts that she is now ready to kill any boss. Kariboshi Haruki laughs and asks Karen to relax and first she must learn to control her power, and then. But later, Karen kills three bosses on the seventh floor with one blow. Kariboshi Haruki is shocked. Kariboshi Haruki asks Karen that maybe they won't waste their energy on small fish, and he thinks she should learn better how to control her new power. He almost escaped from the dungeon. Later, Kariboshi Haruki and Karen emerge from the dungeon. They think they are going to fall off their feet. It's already 6 in the evening. More than 5 hours underground and not a single clue about the missing Uimoto. I no longer had the strength to go below the 7th floor. Karen lowers her head, and Kariboshi Haruki thinks that they shouldn't lose heart. He thinks it's too early for them to go down to the 8th floor. Later, the salesboy apologizes to Kariboshi Haruka for waiting. According to preliminary estimates, the skins and fangs he brought were valued at 44,000 yen. He asks if Kariboshi Haruki will be satisfied with this price. He answers yes. The boy says that Haruki has been given a raise especially for Kariboshi. The total is 46,305 yen. Kariboshi Haruki says okay and asks the seller to split it between them. 
He replies that as they wish. The seller says that nothing else, his order has been completed. He can pick it up at a nearby gun store. He doesn't understand what he's talking about. Then a girl comes to them and asks for forgiveness and says welcome. She asks Haruka Kariboshi that he is nothing, right? He doesn't understand how the girl knows his name, or rather his nickname. The girl says that Senpai Yuzuki Akane told her about him. The girl says that Akane said, If a guy in a BDSM mask comes to you, then be polite to him. This is her little brother. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that in fact they are not friends with her, much less relatives. The only thing that binds them is the desire to fool or harm each other. The girl says that this is understandable. But be that as it may, Senpai remains Senpai. Akane herself placed an order for him, two sets of armor. Kariboshi Haruki takes the armor and says that it is first class. She's probably expensive. The girl says that the breastplate is made from the shell of a centipede. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that these are the same shells that he brought. Kariboshi Haruki says it's incredible, so fast. The girl replies that because this is an important order, the armor was made by professionals. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that she can't believe that Akane cared so much about them. He asks how much they charge for two sets. The girl answers him, well, what does he say, nothing is needed. Kariboshi Haruki asks her why. She replies that they are forced to incur such expenses. After all, all the strongest and bravest adventurers went to Shinjuku, and besides them, no one made it to the 8th floor. Many adventurers need help, but now there simply aren't enough people. The girl says that only Kariboshi Haruki and Karen agreed to fulfill their request. She asks Kariboshi Haruki to do anything to save Ui Senpai. Kariboshi Haruki tells the girl that it's good. He will do everything, what is in his power. Later, Kariboshi Haruki and Karen leave and think about how they all love their senpai very much. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that he will save Uimoto, he promises it. She lies all wounded in the grass and breathes heavily. Teen Kariboshi Haruki thinks about what it is. This is some kind of joke. He opens his post to the rescue, there are 14 views and 10 comments. Kariboshi Haruki reads the comments, where they mostly write negative things to him. Kariboshi Haruki thinks enthusiastically that they are finally commenting on him too. He doesn't understand that these guys have superpowers. How do they write comments so quickly? Kariboshi Haruki begins to write, Thank you for your comments. I agree with most of what they wrote to him. Thank you for your advice. Kariboshi Haruki says he needs to try harder today. Later, Karen-san, defeating another monster, tells Haruki Kariboshi that it is time for them to go. They think that he didn't even have time to do anything. Kariboshi Haruki calls Karen-san and says that they haven't fully executed the plan yet, and he. But Karen-san interrupts him, telling her to leave it to him. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about what he actually wanted. Even he considers other people better. Karen-san looks at Kariboshi Haruki and thinks that he is having a hard time because of the constant criticism of his blog. Probably if she had been stronger, he would not have been so depressed. Karen-san thinks that Haruki Kariboshi did not deserve such angry comments. He's certainly a little strange, but he's a good person. Therefore, Kariboshi Haruki decides that next time, she will help him. She will thank him for saving her life. Karen-san thinks that now she has enough strength. And Kariboshi Haruki yells at Karen-san that she doesn't think she went a little overboard. Kariboshi Haruki and Karen-san stop for a break and lay out their supplies. Karen-san says that the boss of the seventh floor also turned out to be a silver wolf. Kariboshi Haruki says yeah, but there's no sign of Ui-san either. Only the eighth floor remains. And when Kariboshi Haruki and Karen-san find themselves on the eighth floor of the Chikaho dungeon, their mouths open in surprise. They stand waist-deep in tall grass. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about how the ceiling is so high here. From floor to floor something new appears. This is incredible. But the grass here is too high, you can't see anything under your feet. They may simply not notice Ui-san. Kariboshi Haruki thinks there is another trap ahead of them. Kariboshi Haruki decides it's better not to rush. But then Karen-san calls him. Karen-san shouts that two silver wolves are approaching them. Kariboshi Haruki asks Karen-san to stop as a goblin appears. But this is not a simple goblin, but a dog walker. A long-armed goblin is a goblin that has long arms and an ugly face. He doesn't live deep underground. And the walker is a goblin that moves with silver wolves. They call him that because from the outside it looks like he is walking dogs. Kariboshi Haruki yells at Karen-san to move back. She asks him what they should do now. Kariboshi Haruki says that the silver wolves are all wounded. It looks like it's limping. Chromals are monsters injured by adventurers due to their thirst for revenge. These monsters are extremely dangerous and aggressive. Kariboshi Haruki shouts to Karen-san. She responds by saying that she understood everything. Karen-san uses magic against wolves, but the goblin dodges the attack, 
and then Kariboshi Haruki rushes into battle. He fights the goblin, parrying and throwing punches as Karen-san calls him, and then the goblin jumps on her, and Kariboshi Haruki shouts to Karen-san to run. He immediately rushes at the monster, protecting Karen-san, and in the end he defeats the goblin. Karen-san approaches Kariboshi Haruki. He says that everything is fine with him. The level has increased, but it has gotten a little worse. He continues saying that the level is of course good, but fighting monsters one by one only wastes time. Kariboshi Haruki says that they will therefore change their tactics a little. Karen-san answers well and asks Kariboshi Haruka what he has in his hands. He replies that they are slippery eels. They seem to provide protection from monsters. The battle took longer than Kariboshi Haruki expected. Kariboshi Haruki entangles Karen-san in eels and asks her if she's okay. Kariboshi Haruki says that he also has Ray on his shoulder. Kariboshi Haruki asks Karen-san to grab the eels with both hands. Kariboshi Haruki happily says great, the search continues. Karen-san thinks that now Kariboshi Haruki looks more like a monster than those wolves. Uimoto is lying in the grass and shaking all over. She thinks that she can't do it anymore. Her left leg is broken. And now she can't just run, she can't even move. She paid dearly for her stupidity. If only there were medicines, but there are none. If only she hadn't dragged herself here after the silver wolves. She thinks that when silver wolves fur becomes dark, the quality of such goods increases significantly. And the deeper a person goes underground, the more often such wolves are encountered. She imagined how people would say, go to the Mitsubishi store in Sapporo, they will get any high quality product. She would be ahead of all her competitors. And she threw out that Viper Yujuki Akane. She thought so, and this is the result. Uimoto lies and thinks that she has no food, no water, nothing. She was saved only thanks to special equipment that eliminated body odor. Uimoto laughs and asks about that and why she needs him. To extend your life. No one will look for an ordinary person like her. Why then is she wasting her last strength in vain? With her rash decisions, she drove herself into a hopeless situation. Well, that's okay, but what if it gets worse? What if she gets dishonored? She imagines being torn apart by monsters. She screams that she's scared, and no, no, no. She screams loudly that she doesn't want to die and asks someone to help her. But then someone makes his way towards her. Uimoto thinks it's a monster. And this is Kariboshi Haruki with a flower on her shoulder. Uimoto screams. Karen-sen tells Haruki Kariboshi that he scared the girl to death. Teen Uimoto lies until someone sets her leg back. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that she has woken up. He introduces himself as the adventurer nothing. They took on a quest to save her. But Uimoto is getting worse. Kariboshi Haruki asks her not to faint, saying that she is heavy and they won't be able to carry her. Uimoto yells at Kariboshi Haruki not to touch her, calling her a monster. Uimoto asks not to mock her, but rather to kill her right away. Kariboshi Haruki asks her to pull herself together. She listens to them here. Kariboshi Haruki says that he and Karen-san took on a quest to find her, which is why they are both here. Uimoto asks about the quest. Kariboshi Haruki tells her that her colleagues from Mitsubishi are waiting for her return. Uimoto is very touched by this, she says, but her leg. She is very surprised that it doesn't hurt anymore. Karen-sen says that she used the recovery medicine and asks Uimoto if she is feeling better. She replies that she is definitely feeling better. Looks like she can walk on her own now. She tells Kariboshi Haruki how she can thank them for even curing her leg. Kariboshi Haruki tells Uimoto that her company took care of everything, so they have already received payment for the medicine. Uimoto says that's how it is. Then just thank you very much. Kariboshi Haruki hands her the eel and asks her to please take it. Later, Kariboshi Haruki and Uimoto, along with Karen-san, arrive at the gate. The gates are equipped with an elevator mechanism. You can move only on those floors that have been opened. Kariboshi Haruki says that they only have to reach the gate, and they are on the surface. But then someone attacks Karen-san and she falls. Kariboshi Haruki calls Karen-san, but then someone shouts that they have finally met. These are the same three adventurers. They tell Kariboshi Haruki that they haven't seen each other for a long time, calling him a masked goat. One of them knocks an arrow and advises Kariboshi Haruki and Uimoto not to move. Kishima says that if Masatsugu says, it's better not to go to that store. No one else will enter it. What if people decide to leave quests in other stores? After all, Ui-san is unlikely to fulfill the order. Uimoto shouts that this cannot happen, that customers will stop coming to their store. Kashima and Lars shout to her that they realized it too late. Uimoto shouts to them that they also angered those monsters and set them on her. Kariboshi Haruki asks them why they need this. Kashima replies that it's really not clear. They decided to take revenge on him. 
Kashima says they made them look like idiots in public, so it's time for them to pay for it. Uemoto shouts at them that this is so stupid, nothing will change if they do this. Kashima says that they don't care much about it. Are they doing something bad? Uemoto shouts that when she reports this, the matter will not end with the revocation of the adventurer's license. Kashima asks Uemoto what she really thinks will come out of the dungeon. Then Lars and Kashima attack Karen-san, planning to do something terrible to her. Lars kicks Karen-san so that she flies to the side. Uisama shouts to the Nothing-san to run to the police, but then she sees that he is not nearby, and he says that nothing has disappeared. The guys don't understand when Nothing managed to escape. They're all screwed if he gets out. They say that until the police show up, they need to hide the evidence. Then they will decide that Nothing lied. Lars raises his sword over Karen-san and is about to kill her. But then Karaboshi Haruki appears between his weapon and Karen-san. He yells at Karen-san to get Ui-san up. And she ran with her. The guys shoot at Haruki's Karaboshi, but Rea deflects the projectile. Ui-sama and Karen-san get out of the dungeon. And Karaboshi Haruki, covering their retreat, thinks that this is great. The guys shout about where Karaboshi Haruki is, not noticing him. And he thinks about what is actually standing in front of him. And is it really possible that their detection skill has not been upgraded at all? Then Karaboshi Haruki appears in front of them. They shout to him about how many more times he will cross their path. Karaboshi Haruki says that he didn't do anything wrong that time. The adventurers tell him that he allows himself a lot. Karaboshi Haruki says that if this is the case, then he thinks that he can handle them himself. They think Karaboshi Haruki is joking. He says that they were not joking when they injured Karen-san. They say that this is an accident, just an accident. Karaboshi Haruki says that ruining his blog is also a joke. Kashima asks Karaboshi Haruka what he is talking about. He replies that there are 10 negative comments and now 6 unique readers. If you don't count his regular readers, it turns out that 3 new visitors to his blog have been added. Just as many as there are. Lars asks Karaboshi Haruka why he has so few readers. They wanted to offend him, but in response they received comments from him with gratitude. And Karaboshi Haruki was glad that he had at least some comments. Some strange sounds are heard here. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that he has a strange feeling. It's like a parade of monsters. And then a lot of goblin dog walkers appear around them. The adventurers enter the battle. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that things are bad. He decides to use skill points. One hand weapon has been upgraded. Karaboshi Haruki begins to fight alongside the adventurers against the monsters. Karaboshi Haruki looks at the adventurers and thinks that in order to survive on the 8th and 9th floors, the adventurers need allies and high skills. Karaboshi Haruki says that they will defeat the monsters and return back. The adventurers are shouting that they will stop ordering them around. But the monsters easily cope with the adventurers, and they find themselves surrounded, and one of the adventurers is defeated by monsters. One Lars and Kashima shout to Haruya that they are on their way, but he no longer hears them. Karaboshi Haruki looks at Kashima and asks what's wrong with him. He sits with tears in his eyes. Kashima tells Karaboshi Haruki that he has never dealt with so many. Karaboshi Haruki thinks Kashima is right. There's no such thing as a huge parade of monsters, but that's not the case this time. If they don't fight, then everyone here will die. Karaboshi Haruki tells Kashima that he is still alive, as is Lars. Karaboshi Haruki shouts to them that once they reach the gate, they will be saved. And no matter how much they like it, they will have to fight shoulder to shoulder. After some time, Lars falls exhausted to the ground. Kashima screams about why no matter how many times they kill them, there are not fewer of them. Karaboshi Haruki thinks there is something to it. Why don't the monsters die down? Although he has already killed more than 300. The dungeon immediately absorbs dead bodies, but the landscape does not increase in volume. The dungeon appears to immediately revive monsters, so this is no ordinary monster parade. Then Kashima goes crazy and rushes straight into the crowd of monsters, which swallows him. Then Rea whispers something in Karaboshi Haruka's ear. He tells Rei that they will get out at any cost. He thinks about what he should find. This is no ordinary monster parade. This horde must have a core. And then Karaboshi Haruki finds him. The monsters seem to emerge from the tumor, but they are not created in the tumor itself. Karaboshi Haruki thinks about the monsters protecting her. Karaboshi Haruki takes off his mask and becomes invisible again. Karaboshi Haruki walks right up to the tumor and stabs it, plunging his daggers straight into it. Two Haruki's Karaboshi tears apart the tumor with a stroke of his daggers. Immediately all the monsters stop. Karaboshi Haruki grabs his face with his hand and thinks about how his level has risen, and he feels sick. He's bursting. Karaboshi Haruki thanks Rea, and then he notices that the bodies are disappearing. They will not rise again. 
Kiraboshi Haruki tells Rea that they need to gather all their strength and get to the gate. The military descends into the dungeon and says that everything is as Masatsugu-san said. The guys were not initially distinguished by good behavior, no matter how many times they had already been arrested. They get out of the elevator and say that in any case, they must grab Shikama's gang by any means possible. But then the military notices a parade of monsters and prepares for battle. But then Kariboshi Haruki shouts at them to stop. He is a man. The military commander asks what it is. Plant and floating mask. Kariboshi Haruki says that he is a nothing adventurer. The military asks the commander what to do, and this nothing from Kashima's company. The commander asks Kariboshi Haruka what's wrong with Kashima. He replies that they could not be saved. Here one of the soldiers draws the commander's attention to the remains of the three adventurers. The soldiers shout that they will help nothing Kun, but the arrows can hit him. They think they can provide Haruki's Kariboshi with an escape route. The commander orders the soldiers all to arms, saying that human life comes first. The soldiers cover Kariboshi Haruka's escape route, allowing him to make his way to the elevator. They all get into the elevator. The soldiers ask Kariboshi Haruka why he is attacking monsters with a short sword. Is his mask magical? It increases his physical characteristics. They ask about Kariboshi Haruka having a monster plant on her shoulder. He replies that yes, he tamed her. The soldiers are shocked by this. The commander shouts to them quietly, saying that they will chat upstairs. He looks at Haruki's Kariboshi and thinks that he is the first to tame the monster. Kariboshi Haruki appears to be an average fighter. Alone, he calmly confronted a parade of monsters and even tamed one. Then the soldier shouts to Kariboshi Haruki that he remembered that he is the same adventurer about whom there are rumors. The commander asks about the famous person in front of them. The soldiers say yes, because Kariboshi Haruki then noticed Masatsugu-san. People wonder if he is a ranker or not. Later, Kariboshi Haruki comes to the place where Karen-san is lying and Uimoto is sitting next to her. Kariboshi Haruki asks about how Karen-san is holding up. Uimoto is surprised to see him. Uimoto apologizes to Kariboshi Haruka for leaving him there. He tells her that it's okay. They tried too. He thanks Uimoto for looking after Karen-san. Then Karen-san comes to her senses, and Kariboshi Haruki approaches her. Karen-san sees him and calls him. Karen-san jumps up on the bed and immediately falls back. Uimoto asks Karen-san to be careful, saying that she shouldn't move so quickly. Kariboshi Haruki asks Uimoto what's wrong with Karen-san. She replies that she has a laceration on her back. She has already applied the medicine to Karen-san. Slight lack of blood, thanks to Karen-san's good armor. Who took the blow, the worst was avoided. Uimoto says that despite everything, nothing-san survived the parade of monsters. Before Kariboshi Haruki arrived, the police explained how hard he tried. Uimoto tells Kariboshi Haruki that he could have avoided taking on the unnecessary pain. Karma knows everything. Those adventurers received retribution for their behavior. She asks Kariboshi Haruki not to hang his nose and not be upset. Later, Karen-san tells Kariboshi Haruki that it was her fault. If only she hadn't been injured. Karen-san says that although she would never ask that group, if she had been more careful, then everyone would probably have survived. If only she had dodged the attack. Karen-san thinks that Haruki Kariboshi would not have to shoulder the responsibility of saving her life. Karen-san asks Kariboshi Haruka for forgiveness. He asks her why she is apologizing. Karen-san says she's sorry because she can't help, because she's pathetic and doesn't deserve forgiveness. If she hadn't existed, then all this. But then Kariboshi Haruki hits her on the head with his palm. He asks Karen-san not to say anything stupid, otherwise he will beat her up. He says these guys would have found a reason anyway. In general, let Karen-san not think what would have happened if she had not existed. This time he was also inattentive. Because he relaxed his reconnaissance measures, Karen-san was injured. Because of him, he asks Karen-san for forgiveness. She screams that she was closing the move and if she had noticed right away. Kariboshi Haruki shouts that if he were even stronger, then no one would have died. Karen-san is silent. Kariboshi Haruki says that he should have been more courageous. He could improve their skills and save them. But he didn't do anything. No one is to blame except him, no one. Kariboshi Haruki touches Karen-san's hand and tells her, let's become even stronger together. Karen-san tells him yes. Later, Karen-san sits and reads an article by Haruki Kariboshi entitled, Our Oal. Karen-san thinks that she is worried about Haruki Kariboshi. He became more emotional in his blogs. Where did the serious Kariboshi-san go? Kariboshi Haruki is happy that he already has five readers. He will become stronger. On the internet they are discussing how nothing-san burst into the parade of monsters. Kariboshi Haruki sits and studies his panel, thinking that his stealth has improved. 
It's been three weeks since they found Ui-san, and he's been irresponsible about leveling up. Karen-san tells Kariboshi Haruki that her abilities have improved, but she didn't spend any skill points. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen-san that many abilities can develop on their own. It was not in vain that he told her to try. Karen-san replies that by the way, she has worked on her control and magic, and now a powerful spell does not cause the staff to fly off into her head. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that he is glad that Karen-san's efforts are turning into results. Kariboshi Haruki and Karen-san enter Yuyujuki Akane's store. She asks Kariboshi Haruka that they can stop coming to her when they have nothing to do. It's just too hot here. Yuyujuki Akane immediately says that she was worried. They had been gone for so long, and she thought that Kariboshi Haruki had finally died. Ten minutes later, Kariboshi Haruki floods Yuyujuka Akane's store with monsters and she screams about how he will ruin her store. She asks Kariboshi Haruka how many monsters he has. He replies that there are about 5,000 of them. Yuyujuki Akane asks where he got so much loot. Kariboshi Haruki replies that he was interested to see what would happen to her face when they brought back a whole month's worth of loot. Kariboshi Haruki thought that Yuyujuki Akane would blind them with a smile. She tells Haruki Kariboshi that she would rather drown them in tears. Later, Yuyujuki Akane calculates the amount on a calculator. Yuyujuki Akane also includes the promised 5% on top. Kariboshi Haruki asks why Yuyujuki Akane was silent. She screams that it turned out to be 3,055,500 yen, they robbed her. Kariboshi Haruki asks Yuyujuka Akane that maybe she got shortchanged, but she shouts that she would be happy to. Yuyujuki Akane is in despair thinking that her store is ruined. Here Kariboshi Haruki calls Yuyujuki Akane. He asks Yuyujuki Akane to pick out armor for them, she asks what they want. Kariboshi Haruki says that the nearest target is on the middle floors. Therefore, he needs all the middle class armor, and for Karen-san, let him choose a full set for the whole body. Yuyujuki Akane says that she will do anything to get her money back. Kariboshi Haruki tells Yuyujuki Akane that if she does it through one place, they will return it back. He leaves, asking Akane Yuyujuki to try harder for them. And Yuyujuki Akane, following Kariboshi Haruki, says thank you for Ui-san. Kariboshi Haruka's ears turned red. He tells Yuyujuki Akane to get everything done by tomorrow no matter what. Later, Kariboshi Haruki and Karen-san pass through the 6th floor, then the 7th floor, then the 8th floor. Karen-san eats peaches and Haruki Kariboshi picks one up. Later, Kariboshi Haruki comes to the store and Yuyujuki Akane tells him that he has ruined her store again. Kariboshi Haruki asks what Yuyujuki Akane thinks about this, these things fell out of the boss. Yuyujuki Akane says that she can assure that the stone in her hands is magical. As soon as you touch it, it starts to heat up. It can be used for cooking. A meter of this ivy costs 10,000 yen. Kariboshi Haruki shouts seriously. Yuyujuki Akane says that this ivy can be used as a string for a bow and other weapons. Yuyujuki Akane says that there is also a coxcomb and a necklace. Yuyujuki Akane picks up the necklace and says that it is clearly not an ordinary necklace. It may be able to increase agility. Kariboshi Haruki says that this is absolutely great. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen Sen that they have to go. Yuyujuki Akane yells at them to wait. She wanted to tell them something. Kariboshi Haruki looks at the dagger that he couldn't lift before. Now he takes the dagger and raises it. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that the dagger is a little heavy, but he will quickly get used to it. Yuyujuki Akane tells Kariboshi Haruki that this dagger seems to have been made for him. Kariboshi Haruki asks how Karen-san is wearing her costume. She says it's a little hard to move in, but she likes it. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about how it is now fully staffed. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that the truth is that now only memories remain from his reward of 3 million. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen-san that they should go to the dungeon, and they need to try their ammunition on a couple of creatures. We need to somehow work off the empty pocket after this Yuyujuki Akane. Karen-san asks Kariboshi Haruka that they will go to the 8th floor. He replies that they need to move on. He wants to go down to the 9th floor. Karen-san replies that what Kariboshi Haruki will say, and she wanted to taste the melon. Kariboshi Haruki and Karen-san go down to the ninth floor. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen-san that he thinks they will meet a new monster here, they need to be on their guard. Karen-san says okay and then calls Kariboshi Haruki. And then a cute animal runs towards them. Karen-san is delighted, but the monster immediately attacks her. Kariboshi Haruki rushes to her aid and kills the monster with one blow. He looks at his daggers and thinks that he has an amazing weapon. The dagger cut through flesh like paper. Kariboshi Haruki tells Karen-san that the beast may be cute, but don't forget that he is still a monster. Kariboshi Haruki says it's time for them to move on. 
Along the way they meet the same monsters. After some time, Kuroboshi Haruki says that they have arrived at the last location. This is probably where the boss of the level lives. Karen-san thinks that the boss will be a giant compared to what they have seen. But then they notice a half-monster, half-human. Karen-san is scared, and Kuroboshi Haruki says that the monster also has weapons. He looks strong. Karen-san adds, and scary. Kuroboshi Haruki thinks that Karen-san is scared because she feels the difference between her powers and his. In order to grow, she must overcome fear. Kuroboshi Haruki tells Karen-san that he doesn't think they can defeat him with their weapons. He doesn't see its weak points. Kuroboshi Haruki says that his instinct tells him that as soon as he gets into the monster's attack zone, he won't be in trouble. Karen-san asks what she should do. Kuroboshi Haruki says that you shouldn't get into trouble with a direct attack. Kuroboshi Haruki sneaks up on the monster quickly. Kuroboshi Haruki engages in a fight with the monster and thinks that his enemy is very agile. But then the monster switches to Karen-san and rushes towards her. Kuroboshi Haruki rushes to her defense and orders Ri to attack. Kuroboshi Haruki grabs Karen-san and they run away. Later, Kuroboshi Haruki exhales and says that it was close. Kuroboshi Haruki thinks that they should change their fighting style, but we still need to work on the current one. Karen-san calls Kuroboshi Haruki. He asks her what it is. Karen-san asks him why he saved her. Kuroboshi Haruki is shocked by her question. At this time, a wounded group of adventurers emerges from the dungeon. The people crowded around are shocked and say that this is a group of rangers. One of them says that they have serious problems. Kuroboshi Haruki asks Karen-san why she is asking such a question. She replies that she is absolutely no good. She's not strong enough. Kuroboshi Haruki replies that no, there is nothing wrong with being confused in a difficult situation. Karen-san shouts that they are partners after all. Kuroboshi Haruki answers yes, that's right. Karen-san asks why Haruki Kuroboshi did not trust her at the most crucial moment. Kuroboshi Haruki thinks that Karen-san means that she could handle it herself. Karen-san says that he, like Kuroboshi Haruki, knows his weaknesses, but they should not be a hindrance in their travels, on their travels together. So she asks Kuroboshi Haruki to trust her. He asks about and how Karen-san wants him to do it. She tells Kuroboshi Haruka to fight at his own pace. He fought and didn't care about her. Karen-san shouts that she has to deal with everything. Kuroboshi Haruki replies that he understands and will count on Karen-san. Kuroboshi Haruki thinks about how he always believed that it was his duty to protect Karen-san at all costs. However, he should not hinder her own development. Kuroboshi Haruki can only trust Karen-san and fight himself. And then the monster approaches them again. Kuroboshi Haruki and Karen-san are ready to fight. They attack the monster together, and Haruki's Kuroboshi stabs the beast with his dagger. Kuroboshi Haruki looks at the back of the monster and thinks that's it. Karen-san tells Kuroboshi Haruki that she will use her magic while he attacks. Kuroboshi Haruki thinks that considering their previous fight, he is sure that this is a very smart demon. Why will they try to use this against him? And in the end, Kuroboshi Haruki and Karen-san defeated the monster, and later both fell ill after increasing their level. Then Karen-san asks Kuroboshi Haruki to pay attention to the spears of different sizes. Kuroboshi Haruki tells Karen-san that they cannot use them in battle since they themselves do not own these weapons. Karen-san asks Kuroboshi Haruki to pay attention to these small spears, but then reshoots Karen-san in the arm. Kuroboshi Haruki yells at Rea about how rude she is to Karen-san. And after Kuroboshi, Haruka and Karen-san decide to go to the middle floor. Later, Kuroboshi Haruki and Karen-san find themselves in the middle of a field. They are still wandering around the dungeon, but they can still see the sky. And all this on just one floor. Karen-san asks Kuroboshi Haruka where the path leads. Kuroboshi Haruki shouts joyfully that he has finally received a divine gift. Karen-san asks what kind of gift this is. Kuroboshi Haruki replies that it's like a blessing from heaven. Masatsugu-san also has this. It seems that in order to receive the divine gift, you had to go down to the middle floor. Kuroboshi Haruki notices that his gift is cloth. He asks how to understand this. Karen-san asks that there are gods who control fabric somewhere. Karen-san asks Kuroboshi Haruka what about her. They see that her gift is a human being. Kuroboshi Haruki says that as expected, he didn't understand anything. But he still thinks that Karen-san's gift will be better than fabric. And re received the divine gift of the earth. Later, Kuroboshi Haruki goes to his laptop with a cup of coffee and thinks that he should see how his blog is doing. He looks at his post, finally, I have reached the middle floor. And then he notices that he received one letter. Kuroboshi Haruki is very happy that someone finally wrote to him. Kuroboshi Haruki decides to control himself and quickly check his inbox. He received a message from Keijimitsu-san with the subject, partner needed. 
and then he receives a system message. Haruki Karaboshi has been added to the chat. Keiji Mitsu san sen has been added to the chat. Keiji Mitsu san apologizes for the sudden invitation. Karaboshi Haruki replies that he was a little surprised. He couldn't imagine that he would ever receive a message from Keiji Mitsu san himself, the best ranger in Hokkaido. He replies that he didn't think Karaboshi Haruki was that famous. Karaboshi Haruki replies that he must be joking. Hokkaido cannot be imagined without three things, bears, crabs, and Keijimitsu-san. Karaboshi Haruki asks what the matter is, why he was needed. Keijimitsu-san asks that Karaboshi Haruki has not heard about the monster invasion occurring on the middle floors of Chikaho. Karaboshi Haruki replies that no, this is the first time he's heard. Which floor exactly? Keijimitsu-san replies that it is on the 10th. He learned about Karaboshi Haruka's progress and decided to offer him participation in an expedition to clear out monsters. Karaboshi Haruki asks why him. Keijimitsu-sen says that there are rumors that he Karaboshi Haruki managed to cope with an entire invasion of monsters alone. Karaboshi Haruki replies that he only recently managed to reach a new level with difficulty. He is afraid that he is not strong enough. Keijimitsu-sen replies that there is only one way to know for sure. They don't have time. They must do something to prevent the monsters from invading. Karaboshi Haruki replies that he cannot. He just can't handle it. He hasn't even reached the 10th floor yet. Keijimitsu-san answers him clearly. It's a pity. He thinks that one day Karaboshi Haruki will also become famous by practicing strategy. Karaboshi Haruki shouts that he agrees and please let him be accepted into their ranks. Karaboshi Haruki comes to a dilapidated building and thinks that this is the home of the leading Hokkaido Ranger. Karaboshi Haruki rings the bell and a girl opens the door for him. Karaboshi Haruki enters a room where people are already sitting. Karaboshi Haruki greets the guy, saying that he is nothing. The one he greets is Keijimitsu-san. Karaboshi Haruki thinks about how he feels worthless compared to Keijimitsu-san. He introduces his squad to Karaboshi Haruka. There is Yeshi, an archer, Becky is also an archer. Next is Van, who, like Keijimitsu-san, wields a sword, and Doraniko, who wields a spear. Karaboshi Haruki says it's nice to meet you. He tells Keijimitsu-san that his team is so humble. Keijimitsu-san tells Haruki Karaboshi that this is their reaction to his mask. Keijimitsu-san tells Karaboshi Haruki that he has certainly heard about this feature of his. Keijimitsu-san tells Karaboshi Haruki that he can't be seen without a mask on his face. That's the whole point. This is a really cool skill. Karaboshi Haruki replies that no, that's not true. Karaboshi Haruki takes off his mask and says that this is not a skill at all, he was born this way and then he disappeared for everyone. Keijimitsu-san tells Karaboshi Haruki that he understands his feelings. He always dreamed of becoming a real ninja, but he was never able to master the skill of stealth. Karaboshi Haruki says that Keijimitsu-san is lucky, but it's time for them to start the meeting. Keijimitsu-san says that, as he already said, they want Karaboshi Haruki to join them on a mission to clear out monsters. What kind of monsters will they have to deal with? For the most part, the parade of monsters will consist of man-eaters. Keijimitsu-san fought with one of these last time. For everyone present here, hunting on the 14th floor is nothing new, so this will not pose any difficulties for them. But who can create problems is the boss. Lizard Man is one of the rarest surviving demi-humans. This monster usually appears on the 30th floor. Karaboshi Haruki swallows while speaking on the 30th floor. In this case, he has no idea how he can help them and again asks why they chose him. Keijimitsu-san says that because only Karaboshi Haruki is capable of this. He screams in shock. Keijimitsu-san says that Karaboshi Haruki wants to earn fame for himself. And does he know another such fool who would recklessly agree to participate in such a meat grinder? Karaboshi Haruki is dumbfounded. Keijimitsu-san says there is another reason. At the moment, most of the strongest and most experienced warriors are moving towards Shinzuku. There are only newcomers left here to tinker with whom they don't have time. And that is why they decided to accept a minimum number of people into their ranks, in order to simplify the task. Moreover, they do not have to win the upcoming battle at all costs. Becky says they'll take a break if it gets too hot. Doraniko says that by attacking in series they will be able to reduce their number without much loss of stamina. Karaboshi Haruki talks about how he worked alone for a long time. It is unlikely that he will immediately be able to find his bearings and work in a team. Van tells Karaboshi Haruki not to worry about it, they will keep an eye on him. Karaboshi Haruki thinks about how he will fight side by side with the elite. Karaboshi Haruki says great, so be it. He asks what the instructions will be. And then Karaboshi Haruka is told to deal with all the man-eaters. Karaboshi Haruki is shocked. Karaboshi Haruki says that he must deal with them all alone. This is side. 
Keiji Mitsu san tells Karaboshi Haruki that he will go with Yesi. He wants the two of them to deal with the parade of monsters while they are busy with the lizard man. As stated earlier, they will support Haruki's Karaboshi at all times. Their survival still depends on Karaboshi Haruka. He thinks that despite the fact that he is just an adventurer who barely made it to the middle levels, Keiji Mitsu san still talks to him as an equal and does not look down on him. Now he understands why Keiji Mitsu san is so popular. This is the top ranker of Hokkaido. This is also Karaboshi Haruka's chance to compare his abilities with theirs. He speaks well out loud. Keiji Mitsu san says that they have seven days before the operation begins. Until then, he wants Karaboshi Haruki to adapt to the monsters on the 10th floor. Starting tomorrow, they will start from the 8th floor. It may not be their main mission, but Karaboshi Haruki must take his preparation as seriously as possible. Karaboshi Haruki tells Karen san everything and says that this means that he will leave their dungeon for a while. But Karen san can explore it at any time. She thanks Haruki's Karaboshi. He also packs things into the car. Karen san calls Karaboshi Haruki. He turns to her and Karen san asks him to take care of himself. He answers her okay with a smile and says goodbye. And Karen san is left standing alone on the empty road. Later, Keiji Mitsu san's team appears on the first floor of Chikaho's dungeon. People immediately gather around them and ask how deep they will go today. And isn't it risky for the three of them to go together? Keiji Mitsu san replies that they have a newcomer, and here he is. And then the mask of Karaboshi Haruka floats in the air, saying hello to everyone. People are shocked. Later, Keiji Mitsu san calms down Haruki's Karaboshi. He tells Karaboshi Haruki that he is jealous of him and would like to trade places with him. Yoshi says that Keiji Mitsu san calms the tension just by being there. And later they see a goblin with a bat in the dungeon. Keiji Mitsu san asks Karaboshi Haruka that if he wants, they will sort it out together. He says no. He will see to it that there is something to follow by example. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that Keiji Mitsu san killed the previous one so quickly that he didn't even understand anything. And this time he won't miss anything. But Keiji Mitsu san again very quickly deals with the enemy. Karaboshi Haruki is shocked to think about what happened so quickly again. But he noticed something. Keiji Mitsu san's team is very experienced. Wang San blocked the boss's weapon, and Yesi San began firing before the boss realized anything. Keiji Mitsu San then finished off the boss with his long sword. Keiji Mitsu San asks Haruka Karaboshi how he likes their attack. He replies that she is truly amazing. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that he also wants to fight. Later they stand and watch the crowd of monsters. Karaboshi Haruki asks about this being a parade. Keiji Mitsu San says that there have been more monsters since last time. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that this is not a joke. There are really more than 200 monsters, and he needs to kill them all. Is this even possible? Karaboshi Haruki smirks. He thinks that he must do this. He calls Keiji Mitsu san He says with a smile, Okay, let's start. Karaboshi Haruki says good. He is counting on him. He asks Karaboshi Haruki to wait and not rush. They will all be finished if the monsters notice them. Karaboshi Haruki asks about that and what they should do. Keiji Mitsu san says that he will see now. Yes he shoots. Some monsters notice the arrow. He needs to pull the arrow towards him and slowly lure the monsters out of the group. Keiji Mitsu san tells Karaboshi Haruki that now it's his turn. He can have a blast. Keiji Mitsu san tells Karaboshi Haruki that he should not commit meaningless heroism. His death will only make things more difficult for them. Karaboshi Haruki says that he understands everything. He thinks about how everyone is focused on Keiji Mitsu san as usual. He asks Ri to help him please. Karaboshi Haruki rushes to attack. Keiji Mitsu san watches him. He's amazed. This is the first time he has seen this style of fighting. Vaughn says that Haruki's Karaboshi is interesting. Yes he says it is true. Usually the fighting style with a dagger is hit and run, but this guy. He barely moves. And all his attacks do not suffer in speed. Vaughn says that although he has not met many adherents of this weapon. I have to say that Karaboshi Haruki seems like an expert in this matter. Yes he says that he also thought that Karaboshi and Haruka's eyesight was fine. He's really good. He has everything to reach the 10th floor. Keiji Mitsu san says yes, but inside he doubts. He asks Yesi how long it has been. He replies that Karaboshi Haruki has been fighting with him for a minute. Vaughn says that's not very good. Keiji Mitsu san says yes. Ideally it should be 5 seconds. And Karaboshi Haruki makes too many unnecessary movements. Yoshi asks Keiji Mitsu san what they should do. Karaboshi Haruki might die there at this rate. Keiji Mitsu san thinks that he made a mistake with his choice. Maybe he should have looked for someone better. But then Karaboshi Haruki sits down on one knee on the ground. Keiji Mitsu san. Yes he san and one san do not understand what is happening. Karaboshi Haruki raised his level and felt bad. 
they decide that they need to save Haruki's Karaboshi. But then Haruki's Karaboshi moves quickly and kills three monsters very quickly. Kijimitsu San San, Yesi San and One San are surprised that Karaboshi Haruki pulled it off. Karaboshi Haruki calls Yesi sleep and tells him to serve him the next pack of monsters. After some time, Yesi asks Kijimitsu San about how long Karaboshi Haruki will last. How many has he already killed? Isn't that too much? Keijimitsu san looks at the huge number of monster bodies and thinks that yes, it's too much. Keijimitsu san sen goes to Karaboshi Haruki and says that's enough for today. But then Karaboshi Haruki tells him more. He kills the monsters one by one, re-helps him. Haruki's Karaboshi demands more monsters. Keijimitsu san sen tells Yoshi to pull up more monsters before Haruki's Karaboshi is blown away. He begins to carry out the order, and then Kuroboshi Haruki accelerates in his attacks. At the beginning the attack takes 20 seconds, then 15 seconds. Keijimitsu san observes Haruki's Kuroboshi and says that he has just become a key figure in their plan. One Kuroboshi Haruki sees light in the darkness. It looks like he can reach it with his hand. A little bit more. Then Kuroboshi Haruki opens his eyes and sees Keijimitsu san He asks Kuroboshi Haruka if he is okay. Keijimitsu san tells Karaboshi Haruki that he unexpectedly fell in the middle of the fight. He asks for forgiveness, saying that this is the first time in a long time that he has fought like this, but they had the whole situation under control. Keijimitsu san says yes, but Karaboshi Haruki did a great job on his own, and he probably already thought he was dead. He drinks water and says that you can say it like that. Keijimitsu san says that everything is fine now that they are close. He asks Karaboshi Haruka how he felt about the battle. Karaboshi Haruki replies that he thought he had learned all the intricacies of combat when he fought alongside those bandits, but every minute with a weapon in his hands is still hard. He remembered their fighting technique and at the same time refined his own. And when I focused on it, I saw the light. Keijimitsu San Sen tells Karaboshi Haruki that it is time to get ready to go home. Karaboshi Haruki asks what time it is. Keijimitsu San replies that it is exactly 14 o'clock. Karaboshi Haruki says that he wants to hunt some more. If others have other things to do, then he will go alone. Keijimitsu San says, no, no, no. Everything is fine. If Karaboshi Haruki goes, then so do they. Yes, he S. San says it's good that Karaboshi Haruki is on their side. Later, Keijimitsu San writes in the chat that Haruki Karaboshi is simply fierce. Everyone should have seen how the monsters pressed him, and he continued the hunt from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Nine hours straight is a lot. Karaboshi Haruki fights in the Wanko Soba style. This is a method of serving soba in which as soon as the customer finishes one cup of noodles, he is immediately served the next one, and so on until he is full. People write that Karaboshi Haruki probably took a break. Yes, there was one break when he fell unconscious. In the comments, people are wondering how many creatures Karaboshi Haruki has killed. They write there that there are more than 200, although their whole team brought down a maximum of 150. This is not counting the reborn, but with the reborn there are more than 300. Two days later, Karaboshi Haruki walks and turns his head around, thinking that tomorrow is the decisive battle. During these two days he more or less trained, but I would like to do something more. During the day he was in full view of the team, and if he started upgrading his skills, they would probably notice it. Now he is interested in the divine gift. Karaboshi Haruki asks Rei to invest two of her points into a divine gift. She nods in agreement. Karaboshi Haruki says good, and immediately flies out, the keeper of underground treasures Ta. Ta is the god of creativity in ancient Egypt. He was also considered the patron saint of artisans, protecting minerals. His body was depicted in green, which is why he was also called the god of vegetation. This means that the god of vegetation and treasures and re have something in common that unites them. Kiraboshi Haruki concludes what his divine gift has to do with him. He has lost the meaning of life. If Haruka's divine gift of Karaboshi cloth hides his presence, then when he reaches the maximum level, no one will see him again in his life. Gods can't be that cruel. Karaboshi Haruki tells Rea that her skill has improved and she needs to try it. He decides to try it on two goblins and tells Rei to attack them, and then Rei punches through two goblins with one shot. Karaboshi Haruki screams that she killed two people with one shot. The speed of the shot is the same, but its power is many times greater. They are now even more likely to survive the monster parade. They shouldn't lose. The appointed day of battle arrives. Karaboshi Haruki goes and calls Keijimitsu san. He says good morning to him. Keijimitsu san greets him. Karaboshi Haruki asks that these boxes are their supplies. Karaboshi Haruki thinks about Beki san and Doraniko san wearing some kind of equipment. 
Their mood is different from every day. This is their decisive battle. Later they begin preparations. Keiji Mitsu-san opens the drawer and sees slippery eels in there. Keiji Mitsu-san says that they will immediately place the eels around the gate, so that the monsters will not block the entrance to the shelter. All that remains is to lay them out on the ground in lines, and they will complete all the funnels, so they can line up the monsters in narrow rows. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that this is really how they will avoid an uncontrolled environment, but will everything go as it should? He asks Kariboshi Haruka how they will lure the monsters into a trap. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that it turns out that he is not needed at all. Of course, he will fight, but most of them will run past without even noticing him. And then Keiji Mitsu-san gives Haruki Kariboshi a squeak and tells him to use it. These are scarecrow monsters. They live in the middle levels of the dungeon. If you don't want monsters to notice you, it's better not to take the squeak into the dungeons under any circumstances. Kariboshi Haruki says yeah, the meaning is clear. What to do with the boss? Keiji Mitsu-san says that he will take over the boss. Kariboshi Haruki responds well, thinking that he is not useless. Three Keiji Mitsu-san says okay, the eels are laid out. Someone from the team asks how long eels can hold off monsters. Keiji Mitsu-san replies that plus or minus three hours. Other adventurers had tested this before them. But just in case, we measured this time. Kariboshi Haruki speaks clearly. He thinks about what the three-hour limit for exterminating a parade of monsters means. If you estimate that there will be about 540 individuals, this means that in one minute you need to deal with three and four. Kariboshi Haruki asks that he can attack the boss from afar. Keiji Mitsu-san tells him yes, if he wants. Kariboshi Haruki asks you to trust them, because today Rei will give it her all. The girls are interested in how, and yes he tells them that this creepy flower is hitting everyone with potatoes. Until it hits you can't calm down. Keiji Mitsu-san urges his team to prepare slowly. There are still too few of them for a parade of monsters. And there will be a damn boss too. Indeed, they probably should have taken more people. But, as Keiji Mitsu-san said before, if they recruit everyone, they will only suffer greater losses. That's why there are only six of them here. This way they will know each other's strengths better. Keiji Mitsu-san tells his team to be brave. He sees before him elite fighters who deserve to be rankers, who, if they lose, will survive and challenge again. Therefore they dare not die. All of them are only allowed to survive. They will protect the native lands of their comrades fighting in Shinjuku. And immediately the whole team rushes forward, ready for battle. A crowd of monsters is approaching them. Keiji Mitsu-san gives orders to Kariboshi Haruka. The same one takes the squeak out of his clothes while a crowd of monsters is running towards him. And the monster in his hands makes a disgusting and loud squeak. But then the squeaking stops. And Kariboshi Haruki says that it seems his monster is broken. Eden shock. And Kariboshi Haruki says that all they can do is fight. Re fires at the monsters. And in front of Kariboshi Haruka and Yesi there is already a mountain of monster corpses. Yesi enthusiastically says that this is a flower. Kariboshi Haruki sees that Reya is tired. He shouts that that's enough for now and forgive Yesi to cover him. He understood his order. Yes he climbs the mountain of bodies. And Kariboshi Haruki rushes into battle. 5 seconds for 1. How many of these seconds do you need to hold out? How many more need to be killed? Kariboshi Haruki thinks about how much longer his body can handle. Haruki's Kariboshi falls to the ground. Everything around is littered with the bodies of monsters. Kariboshi Haruki wonders where Yesi san is. Did he go to Keijimetsu san? Kariboshi Haruki pours water on a flower and thinks that it would heal him. He notices that the eels have begun to decompose. Has it really been three hours already? They have been fighting the lizard man for three hours now. Kariboshi Haruki understands that he needs to escape. When Kariboshi Haruki comes running, he sees a team barely standing on its feet, fighting with a lizard man. Kariboshi Haruki understands that everyone is no longer strong. Yes, he shouts to Becky and Doraniko. Yes, he, Becky and Doraniko rush to attack. But the lizard repels all attacks with its tail. And then the lizard man throws Yesi, Becky and Doraniko aside with a blow of his tail. Keiji Mitsu-san rushes to attack the lizard. But he doesn't leave a scratch on the boss. Kariboshi Haruki stands and thinks about how he can just stand there and watch. Then he notices the charisma skill 3 out of 5. This is the skill of Keiji Mitsu-san. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about what kind of divine skill he has. He urgently needs to increase the percentage of Keiji Mitsu-san's survivability. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that he seems to have gotten a little carried away. He checks his skills and notices that his stealth has gone from 2 to 3. Kariboshi Haruki begins to panic and then decides to calm down. He has 5 points. Even if he immediately invests everything in leveling up, the boss will still be too tough for him. So what should he do? 
Cage Mitsu-san has so many skills pumped up, but the divine gift is only one. With this skill pumped to the maximum, Reya has become deadlier. Perhaps the divine gift provides more than Kariboshi Haruki realizes. Each point decides the outcome of the battle and mistakes are unforgivable. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that he must defeat this system. Kariboshi Haruka becomes ill from leveling up. He thinks that he needs to do something already. Here Kariboshi Haruki looks at the name of God in shock. Cruel. He didn't miss a single blow. How strong is the lizard man? Cage Mitsu-san thinks that he is really the last one who is able to fight. What about Van and Doranik? How much longer can Cage Mitsu-san stand alone? Cage Mitsu-san sticks his sword into the ground and thinks about how he doesn't want to die, and he will not allow his comrades to be killed. Cage Mitsu-san picks up the sword and thinks that he will not take a single step back. Kariboshi Haruki thinks about how he is scared. It's been the same feeling ever since. A few years ago, someone was following him in the hallway. He just caught my eye. He was invited to join the club. There's a party tonight and he might come. It's not good for such a noticeable guy not to go. Cage Mitsu-san thinks that because of his visibility, he went to Sapporo, but it only got worse. How he wished he could live unnoticed, like a ninja. Then he sees Woodless attacking a crowd of people. Cage Mitsu-san screams when he sees how easily the monster is dealt with the people. He shouts about why he is so noticeable. Why is everyone around dead and where should he run? Cage Mitsu-san sees blood, pain and horror, and he thinks that enough is enough. Cage Mitsu-san loudly shouts enough, and then people begin to fight back against the monsters. And then Cage Mitsu-san notices that all the monsters are looking at him. Cage Mitsu-san runs away from monsters, and then some girl throws a hammer at him from the balcony. He shouts to the girl that she is a fool, what if she killed him? The girl screams that she didn't kill her and Cage Mitsu-san needs to fight with this hammer. Cage Mitsu-san shouts that he doesn't know how. The girl shouts that if it is not Cage Mitsu-san who kills, then they will kill him. He can do it. Cage Mitsu-san asks how the girl has so much confidence. At this time, a wolf jumps onto the girl's balcony. Cage Mitsu-san shouts at the dog to look here, and the wolf immediately rushes at Cage Mitsu-san. Nothing changed. What before, what now? Maybe visibility is his weapon. On that day, the moment Cage Mitsu-san found meaning for his ability, he firmly decided that he would give his life in the fight for those who were important to him. Cage Mitsu-san yells at everyone else to run while the boss is busy with him. And after that, Cage Mitsu-san rushes into battle. Cage Mitsu-san rushes at the monster, but then something rushes past him in the air. And then two spears pierce the lizard's eye. The monster begins to scream loudly in pain. Cage Mitsu-san is shocked and thinks that this is the first time he has hit the monster. But who and how? And what to do now, retreat or finish? And then they start hitting the monster one after another. Cage Mitsu-san thinks this is his chance. Will he be able to? Someone attacks the monster from behind, and his blows are useless. All he can do now is distract the monster's attention. If the monster focuses on the Cage Mitsu-san series, then it will not be able to follow the attacks from the back. Cage Mitsu-san looks at the monster and realizes that its movements are becoming rougher. The monster is nervous. He clearly wants to deal with whoever is behind him. But Cage Mitsu-san cannot lose sight of him either. Cage Mitsu-san thinks that he will be able to restrain the monster for a long time. And whoever attacks him from behind, Cage Mitsu-san asks him to hurry up. And this is Kariboshi Haruki, who attacks the monster. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that the monster's armor cannot be penetrated. He doesn't mind his blows, Ri's attacks barely destroy his scales. Kariboshi Haruki says he needs something different. Kariboshi Haruki avoids the attacks of the lizard's tail. And then he hears a voice in his head that says, Don't be afraid, pull yourself together. When the monster attacks, a glow appears for a moment, which can be hit. This light, which appeared in battles before, shines at different points in different individuals. If you hit them accurately, then the enemy is finished. Kariboshi Haruki thinks that he understands everything. And immediately seeing the light, he chops off the lizard's tail, and then shouts to Cage Mitsu-san to hit the monster in the neck. Kariboshi Haruki and Cage Mitsu-san attack the monster together, and then he falls dead to the ground. Kariboshi Haruki falls to the ground, happy that he has a new skill. Later, Cage Mitsu-san's team celebrates their victory. Becky asks who finished off the monster. Cage Mitsu-san replies that he doesn't even remember. When the lizard's tail flew off, he heard the voice of nothing. Did you see how nothing slaughtered an entire flock? Someone has heard a lot about what Kariboshi Haruki did in training, but still how he did it. And that's how he realized that he had to hit the lizard in the neck. The waitress immediately approaches them and says that here is the Karaj chicken. But they didn't order. The waitress says that the chef is a big fan of them, and therefore these dishes are at the expense of the establishment. They begin to discuss with them nothing or not. 
When they leave the cafe, they look around again in search of nothing and think about where he disappeared to. He was probably tired and went to bed, and Karaboshi Haruki was with them all the time. Karaboshi Haruki stands and looks after the leaving team and thinks about why God hates him so much. He was standing right in front of them. Why doesn't anyone notice him? Okay, in a massacre, his enemies don't see him, but among people that's why. Karaboshi Haruki thinks about what kind of divine protection this is. A creature covered with fabric amazes everyone, remaining invisible to prying eyes. Karaboshi Haruki thinks about the god from the legends of ancient Egypt. He is called the god of overthrow because he saw the weaknesses of his enemies. According to another version, he seemed to emit light from his eyes. Karaboshi Haruki thinks about who he is. Karen San comes out of the dungeon and wipes her forehead. She thinks that the temperature in the dungeon is completely different. How many days have already passed since Karaboshi Haruki went on a quest? There is so much discussion on the internet about the Chikaha Monster Parade. The masked man who saved Keijimitsu-san is definitely Karaboshi Haruki. And no one believed that a man with daggers, which are considered the weakest weapons, was able to defeat a boss that Keijimitsu-san could not cope with. But Karaboshi Haruki is capable of this. Karen thinks that she does too. She wants to be as strong as Haruki's Karaboshi when she masters the divine gift. But she still has to improve and improve before that. She decides to sell what she has mined, buy equipment and hone her moves. Karen comes in and greets Yujuki Yujuki Aken. Just sit and fan yourself from the heat. She says Karen is the masked man's girlfriend. Karen says Yujuki Aken still doesn't remember her name. Yujuki Aken tells her that it is a bit hot today. Karen asks Yujuki Aken if she will buy the product. Yujuki Aken asks Karen that she is hunting alone. She answers yeah. Yujuki Aken tells Karen that she thought she lived with her legs dangling from nothing's neck. Karen asks in what sense. Yujuki Aken tells her that he is very straightforward. And is Karen planning to break up with him anytime soon? Who is she to nothing? Young woman. Karen screams no. Yujuki Aken says that means Karen is a teammate. But Karen is silent, and Yujuki Aken says that Karen herself doesn't know. She's nothing but a wuss, but that's what she can tell Karen. The rate of progress of Karaboshi Haruka is abnormal. Plus, as a hunter he has great potential, and his strength will only continue to grow. Karen didn't think that at this rate she would become just a burden to him. Karen remains silent, and Yujuki Aken tells her that judging by her expression, she has been thinking about it. Yujuki Aken tells Karen that if this is the case, then it is time for her to start thinking about her own destiny. Karen yells at Yujuki Aken that she has no right to say such things, and then she uses her magic to split Yujuki Aken's table. Karen looks at her staff and thinks that she used magic outside the dungeon. How did she do it? This is because of a new level of divine gift. Yujuki Aken yells at Karen about what she did to Mr. Mitsuru. Karen doesn't understand who it is, and Mr. Mitsuru is the table. Yujuki Aken shouts at Karen that she will take revenge on her for the death of Mr. Mitsuru, and let Karen go outside. At the same time, she finishes off Mr. Mitsuru with her foot. Karen and Yujuki Aken walk out onto the street. Karen apologizes to Yujuki Aken for Mr. Mitsuru. Yujuki Aken tells Karen that an apology will not bring back Mr. Mitsuru. Or Karen was scared. Nothing will call for help again. Karen screams at her no. Yujuki Aken says that if this is the case, then let Karen show what she is capable of. Yujuki Aken continues, telling Karen that when she wins, she will bring back a box of high-end tangerines. Karen answers her well, not understanding what high-class tangerines mean. Karen thinks that she just got into a fight. Yujuki Aken is very strong, and Karen was previously interested in the power of Yujuki Aken san, so she looked for information about it on the internet. Yujuki Aken san was known as a warrior salesman. But her real power is to reveal the talents of unknown adventurers. She has already raised many adventurers who are not inferior to rankers. Karen thinks that this is her chance to discover her strengths, and that this is Karen's chance to prove to herself that she is worthy of being next to Karaboshi Haruki. And then Karen uses magic to attack Yujuki Aken. And the last one flies off and falls to the ground. Karen runs to Yujuki Aken, shouting to her if she is okay. She asks for forgiveness, saying that she did not calculate her strength. She doesn't understand where Yujuki Aken's head is. And then she gets up, smoke coming from her hair. Karen says thank god Yujuki Aken is alive. And she screams at Karen that she is a coward. Yujuki Aken yells at Karen that it's not fair. She didn't know her stupid stick was shooting. Karen doesn't understand. And Yujuki Aken shouts that it doesn't count, it doesn't count. Yujuki Aken takes Karen by the hand and drags her along, saying why should they waste their energy, 
It's time for them to go. Karen asks her where, and Yuyujuki Akane says that he's going hunting in the dungeon. Karen thinks that Yuyujuki Akane's head was almost torn off, but he had more than enough strength. And Yuyujuki Akane is really strong. She's a better match for Haruka's Karaboshi than Karen. She stops, and Yuyujuki Akane, who is pulling her along, also stops. She turns to Karen and says that she has such magic. Karen sniffles. Yuyujuki Akane tells Karen that she thinks the power of the nothing can definitely be counted on. Karen looks up at her, eyes full of tears, and immediately lowers her head. Yuyujuki Akane asks Karen to show her her powers. She will make Karen stronger with her experience and advice. She looks at Yuyujuki Akane in shock with eyes full of tears. Karen thinks that she deserves it and says thank you very much to Yuyujuki Akane. And the two of them go down into the dungeon. After some time, Kiraboshi Haruki arrives at the house. He stretches, saying home sweet home. He takes out Rea and thinks about how it was bad, it was very bad. But Keiji Mitsu-san mentioned him in his blog, and his page was bookmarked by five more people. This is his path to recognition. Kiraboshi Haruki looks at the dungeon entrance and thinks about Karen being there today. He'll probably come down later too. But first, Kiraboshi Haruki looks at the store. Kiraboshi Haruki walks to the door of the store and thinks about how hot it is, and there is nowhere to hide from the sun. Kiraboshi Haruki doesn't understand why the door to the store is closed. He calls Akane and asks if she is here. And then Kiraboshi Haruki sees Akane and Karen, who are sitting and trembling, huddled together. They have tears in their eyes. Kiraboshi Haruki shouts what happened to the two of them. Kiraboshi Haruki asks what they were doing here and what happened. Akane replies that it's nothing. They tried different training techniques. Karen says she's on the 10th floor, but Akane tells her to keep quiet. Kiraboshi Haruki asks about what it is, and he decides to go see for himself. Karen and Akane follow him. Karen asks Akane not to let go of her hand. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks that the girls became friends while he was away. Kiraboshi Haruki tells Akane that about her equipment, it was made by the Banma company. Is it possible for them to use products from competitors? Akane replies, what should she do? Her company doesn't make that stuff. She has offensive defensive tonfa with jet engine blades. Akane tells Haruki Kiraboshi that he himself is dressed up somehow unusually. He wears armor made from lizard man scales. Akane tells Kiraboshi Haruka that she needs to be more attentive to her opponent's attacks. After all, it is fabric based. Such armor should protect against slashing blows. Akane says that they should try to study its properties in more detail. Kiraboshi Haruki says that among their party, only he was able to make armor. Akane says that Haruki Kiraboshi is wearing a mask, potatoes, scales, and where did he lather himself like that? He replies that he has decided to become a ranger. Kiraboshi Haruki asks them why the two of them decided to go down to the dungeon. Akane replies that yes, he and Karen had a fight. Akane says that Karen choked her with magic. Kiraboshi Haruki asks about Karen using magic. Akane says yes, and they decided that the hunt would judge them. And there she saw what was preventing Karen from growing. Kiraboshi Haruki asks her what she is talking about. Akane replies that Mitsubishi is now considering her as a candidate for further sponsorship. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks about how it could be that the company is willing to sponsor an adventurer who is not even a ranker. Kiraboshi Haruki asks Akane that it is because Karen has magic. She answers him yes. Kiraboshi Haruki thinks this is a harsh response, and this Akane is unlikely to be dangerous for Karen. Kiraboshi Haruki tells Karen that she is a good girl. Karen apologizes to Kiraboshi Haruka for only choosing her. Kiraboshi Haruki asks Akane if there is any suggestion for him too. She tells him no, and then they arrive on the 10th floor. Akane and Karen tell Haruki's Kiraboshi to go first. He doesn't understand what's wrong with them when he sees the monster that scared them in front of him. Kiraboshi Haruki finds him adorable. Kiraboshi Haruki tries to attack the monster and thinks that its body is very elastic, and attacking with a blunt weapon will not help. But then Karen defeats all the worms with her magic and switches off. Kiraboshi Haruki says to Karen with a smile as she wakes up, They're going to eat Lutz. These are sea creatures that often wash ashore after storms. Karen watches Haruki's Kiraboshi prepare Lutz. He brings the plate to Karen and says that the first piece is hers, since her contribution to the victory is greater than theirs. Karen is very grateful and says thank you. Akane argues with Haruki Kiraboshi that she also wants to eat, and Karen gratefully eats the food. The next day, Kiraboshi Haruki asks Karen that she used thunder magic yesterday. Karen answers yes. Kiraboshi Haruki asks her how long she has owned it. Karen replies that she has been thinking since she received the divine gift. One day she discovered that she could do something a little. Kiraboshi Haruki asks Karen why she showed Akane that she has magic. 
Karen replies that it can be a secret. Karaboshi Haruki thinks that there is a reason for this. He and Karen have been partners for a long time, but he still doesn't know so much about her. Karaboshi Haruki tells Karen that when divine gifts improve, physical skills also improve. Karen asks Haruki's Karaboshi not to raise her level, saying that she wants to raise it with her own powers. She wants to know how much work it takes to increase her strength in the same way that a skill bar would do. Suddenly, now it's easy for them, and then, having crossed some line, no amount of effort will bring progress. Karaboshi Haruki tells Karen that he understands her. It is stupid not to take advantage of the attraction to power while it is in us. And those things for which they now shed blood and sweat will help them out later, when life decides to drive them into a corner and tries to break them. And then Karaboshi Haruki kills the worms. Karen thinks about how Haruki's Karaboshi killed the monsters with one attack. She asks him how he managed to cut them with daggers, because their bodies are more than a meter in diameter. He's got a new skill. Karaboshi Haruki tells her no, the most common attack, just like with bamboo. The ability to see enemies' weak points must have come from a divine gift. And now even he himself finds it difficult to call himself a human being. 